Hi, it's me again. I just want to let you guys know that this is a super cut from my last Evangelion review, which means certain aspects are not up to par. But I did make some edits to make it more polished as possible, and to make some corrections and statements, which means I'm George Lucas in it. But unlike George, I have a playlist of my old reviews if you're curious to check it out. Just thought to let you guys know, and uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Fucking assholes. Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.0 Thrice Upon a Time is a mixed bag of a movie, and I'm not the only who's saying this, especially if you are paying attention to the production. But alas, we have a lot of people who are very disappointed in this movie. My disappointment is immeasurable, and my day is ruined. Which is kind of surprising since 3.0 was a really big letdown. Now, to be fair, this film was well received in its home country of Japan, and it became one of the highest grossing movies in the Japanese box office. Although other movies beat it to the punch, I would say it's still at least an accomplishment, especially when you consider the movie was released during the coronavirus pandemic. Now I'm not saying that everyone in Japan liked the movie, but I can at least safely say that this movie was better well received in 3.0. So judging how Japan reacted, it would at least be well received in the West, right? Yeah, that was horrible. <laughs> Um, how, you know, do we feel like the, uh, the eight-year wait was worth the wait, and, uh, did the movie live up to the hype? It, it couldn't possibly live up to the hype. I think a lot of people really, really love this movie. I do think we're looking at Phantom Menace Syndrome, to be honest. Uh, I think that it's a relatively poor, poorly made film. If I had to give you a one-word review of the movie, I would definitely make that word cowardly. You know, I've seen a lot of movies in my day, but that one really takes the cake. The shit cake for the shitty movie because it's 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 a, it's a horrible movie, you know? I've seen YouTubers. It, it... Well, fuck. Now, to be fair, this film wasn't totally panned, and a quite few people did enjoy it. Told you I didn't hate the movie. But the reaction was really mixed at best, at least in the Ava fandom here. Some people think this is worse than 3.0, which they're wrong. But that's why I'm also here. I'm gonna be your guide here to understand why this movie is a mixed bag of a film. And yes, I know it's been a while since my last review, and a lot of opinions have changed since then. But I guarantee you, I might be able to convince you in some shape or form. So in order to understand this movie, we have to understand one thing. How, what, and why are the rebuilds made in the first place? In order to do that, we need to go back in time for a bit. Contrary to popular belief, the rebuilds were actually being made earlier as 2002, though they were called Evangelion 2 at the time. And Hideaki Anno actually wanted to have other people work on Evangelion, but a lot of people got confused by this and didn't want to make a sequel to Evangelion. Serious? So to make things more clear, Anna decided to call it G Evangelion based on the anime Mobile Fighter G Gundam. So in a way, Anna wanted to remake Evangelion and make it more like the Gundam franchise where they make new series for a new audience to enjoy so they could use the money to help the anime industry. It's one of the main reasons why Kara exists. Now, whether or not you like the man, you have to admit, at least he was business smart. And coming from a company that was a financial disaster, that's actually understandable. It is indeed admirable to help out the anime industry, both financially and creatively. Take a look at the Anime Expo. Now the rebuilds were supposed to be in a double feature, and the ending was going to be different. However, plans quickly changed, both from the popular 1.0 and the production taking longer than expected. Here's the thing, they did have a plan from the start. The problem was the plan was constantly changing. It's the main reason why things took this long, and it also affected Anno too. And by the end of 3.0's production, Anna was simply just burned out. He got depressed again, and he thought he'll never work on Evangelion again. 
なん全部書き出したわけじゃないですか全身全霊書けないと面白くならないからですよね自分にできることは全部やっとかないとなるべく面白いものをしたいっていうだけだと思いますよ He was so depressed after making three put out, he didn't return to the studio for about a year. Although he said he was working on the final film. To many of us, the message was clear. Anno probably would never work on Evangelion ever again, and the final film would never get released. Wow, that sucks. That is until he made Shin Godzilla with his friend Chiji Aguchi. Although there were other factors, Shin Godzilla was the one that brought back Otto back on his feet, and he had enough creative energy to finally finish Frice Upon a Time. Not just for himself, but to all the Ava fans who waited all this fucking time. I started and I was going to finish the game. It was the most important thing for me, the most important thing for me, the most important thing for me. I do commend him for actually trying to finish this, despite all the hardship that comes with it. And was he successful? What? In all fairness though, I will give Otto some credit. At least they were being honest with what happened. Just like this other filmmaker. All I need is an idea. Now all jokes aside, at least Otto is telling the truth of what happened during the film's production. The NHK documentary was a source of good information and good entertainment. I have no idea. There was a lot of information on what happened during the production. But we got some more information recently, as of the time of recording. What a time to be alive. So anyway, now you know the backstory of the rebuild in general. So let's dissect this sucker. So the movie starts out in Paris covered red shit. We then discover that Willy is making a plan to steal supplies from Nerve. <laughs> But they're also planning to restore the city with a device that looks like an atomic bomb, which is designed to clear out L barrier density. We also discover that L barrier density is kinda like nuclear radiation, given the fact that characters treat it as such. And the fact they're wearing suits. So really you can't technically breathe in there, but you will die and turn to 10. So it does at least make some sense. 
Thank you! However, there are some problems I noticed. First off, if this thing can affect humans and animals, then how come plants are not affected? You guys do know that grass and trees are not just background, right? They're living organisms too, and you would think they'll at least show some dead trees at least. But no, the trees seem to have their leaves on. So if the third impact can affect pretty much any organism, then why not trees? Does the third impact just freeze plants? Or are they just fake trees? Why is everything chrome? Everything is chrome in the future! Secondly, if the third impact can affect the ocean, then how come it doesn't affect fresh water? Wouldn't it also be red as well? Look, I understand this is like a purifier or something, but isn't the entire place abandoned? Even if that was true, it still wouldn't change the fact that a place like that needs maintenance. Anyway, we then discovered that they need to complete the thing within 720 seconds. But Nerve finds out, and they're trying to stop them, so it's up to Mar to buy them some time. Oh. Double kill, triple kill, overkill, kill, 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 kill. And for some reason, we get some comments about the use of Evangelions in the military, which is forbidden by the Vatican Treaty. Now, what is the Vatican Treaty? From my understanding, it is a treaty that allows only three AVA units per country. It's the main reason why Unit 2 gets put in storage, while Unit 3 serves Asuka's replacement. But that's only mentioned in 2.0 in this movie. In fact, it never comes up again. But I do find it odd that Ritsuko even mentions this. Like, isn't civilization basically dead? Why mention the treaty when the treaty doesn't really matter at this point? Kinda feels really redundant there, Ritsuko. So I have to make some silly noises and some terrible English. Many a small bird drive away a hope, eh? She pretty much beats all the Ava helicopters and turns into a ball and throws out a building or something, and then they just blow up. Despite her victory, it was all a big distraction, so the real boss could come and beat her. It's basically just an Evangelion octopus, and it gets powered up by Evangelion Ken Ken members. Now, despite the ridiculous design, it's actually pretty powerful because it has the same stack arrival that killed Ramiel in one point. But because Willy was prepared for this, they used the other ships as a shield to block the laser beam. All it does technically work, they use up all their shields and they're about to die because of it. So thinking quickly, Mar uses the Eiffel Tower to stab the Ava Octopus in the face. <laughs> So anyway, she beats the octopus, it goes boom. She wins, they basically make it in time, and everything gets restored in Paris. Including the plants. And the water. They basically go there and get some resupplies. Including some new parts for Unit 2 and 8, so they can do some more product play, I mean, for the next battle to come out. Now despite my complaining, I actually did enjoy myself while watching this. It does explain Willy's resource problem, and it also explains L Barry Density more. Thank you! And although it wasn't perfect, and there's a lot of flaws with it, and honestly didn't bother me that much. It's okay to enjoy things and like it at the same time. So after all of that, we can finally see the movie proper. And we do see Shinji again, but he's under the mindset of killing himself. Especially after the last film. <laughs> And who could really blame him? The guilt and shame that Shinji experienced is so bad that he doesn't want to live anymore. To die. Alone.
But then a car shows up and picks them up. We then discover that Shinji's in Village 3. Yes, Village 3. How original. And we discover that the majority of characters from 2.0 actually survived, including Akari, Kansuke, Toji, even Pen Pen lives. Toji and Akari even have a baby. That's so great. Isn't that great? Now I'm totally fine with the classmates surviving the third impact. I'm even fine with Toji and Akari having a baby. And I'm happy they're all alive and doing well for themselves. But don't you think it's a little convenient that they're all survive at the same time? Especially from the hints from 3.0? Yes, to be fair, they did explain how they all survive. But even then, it's still a little convenient. The fact that if it weren't for him and Toji, then Shinji probably would have killed himself earlier. Yeah, I know, it's not that damning. And Price is not the only one that's guilty of this. But at least it's something I like to point out. And besides, I actually did like seeing the old gang back together. So it obviously didn't ruin for me. Again, it's okay to recognize flaws in something, but still enjoy it at the same time. So then Toji introduces Rei and Shinji to Village 3. Um, not sure that's really chilly out there, Toji, especially when it looks like summer. While exploring Village 3, we then see a woman who's preggers. Life, uh, finds a way. Now, despite the characters being older here, this is not Willy. This is actually Credit. This is another faction that's designed to be a haven for survivors and for supplies for Willy. A bit like a symbiotic relationship. Apparently, Credit is supposed to give him supplies for Willy, while Willy is given protection from Nerve and the L density barrier, which is why we see those dildo things later on in the film. And it actually makes much more sense here than the last one. In 3.0, we had no idea where to get all these resources and supplies. In Thrice, it makes much more sense thanks to credit. Thank you! We then see Ray look at a cat, thinking that's a dog. Now it is nice that Toji's helping out Ray, but don't you think his reaction is a little strange? Especially the fact that she has no idea what a cat is? And it's not the fact that she's a random person. Toji knew her from high school. His reaction should be a little puzzled, at least. Now I'm not saying that he can't be nice to Ray, nor I'm not saying it's not possible that he didn't know. But for Toji as a character, he should be at least be confused. Even if he's a nicer guy. This is something I'll give the English dub some credit. What is that? It's shaped differently from dogs. Uh, that's a cat. I know, I know, it's not that big of a deal. And I might misunderstand the tone of the Japanese dub. And I don't even understand Japanese. But I think it's another thing that at least should be pointed out. <laughs> Speaking of dubs, can I mention how bad this dub is? Tell me, what is credit? That's right, it's delicious. Well, those are some tight-fitting clothes you're wearing there. Now, I didn't want to talk about the dubs for the rebuilds because there really isn't much to say about them. However, I am going to mention this dub since Kara was technically involved. Supposedly, Kara was not happy with Funimation's dub of 3.0. Apparently, the dub was not that good and the reception was pretty poor. And because of this, Kara had to be more involved and Funimation had to redo the dubbing all over again. This is the reason why the Netflix dub is much more literal due to them being translated by Dan Katsumitsu. But to be honest, it's not that bad of a dub in retrospect. In fact, I prefer the Netflix dub more than the ADV dub, though I will admit the dub does get too literal. I'm the second children. I'm the fifth children. What? Because keep in mind, the old ADV dub 
is not that good. The heart feels pain so easily, some believe life is pain. In a very real sense, the Magi's brains are my mother. The Chamber of Guff is open. The door to both the beginning and the end of the world. Congratulations! How would I know? Misato could choose me for the position! Shinji, would you ask her for me? I really want to be an- Though I wouldn't say that's really surprising since ADD has a history of poor dubs. Why don't we circle around the island once and then go in for a landing? Oh, Shut sorry. up and move! Sir, we've got multiple small bogies emerging from the jewel! Oh, ships! <laughs> Fire with lasers! Now, I understand this was a product of its time, and dub and anime was in its infancy. Nothing beats a jelly-filled donut. But even then, it's still not aged well. Granted, there's some exceptions to the rule. John Swayze does pretty good as Gendo. The Atom Revival Project. And that is Evangelion Unit Zero, our system prototype. Prototype? Prototype of what? Fyutsuki, will you join us in creating a new genesis for mankind? And Tiffany Grant... I think he's pretty good as Oscar. <laughs> I've got to actually ask about um, the German because when you did that original dub, I imagine seeing, okay, I'm going to have to speak some German for this role must have been quite an interesting experience. Did you have prior language experience before then? Yes, uh -huh. yes, I could already speak German. So I was really, I was really excited about that aspect of the character that just like was coincidentally fantastic for me from my point of view. Now, I'm totally fine people enjoying this dub for what it is, but man, you gotta admit, it's not aged well. Now, to be fair, the Amazon dub does bring back the original voice cast for the ADV dub. So surely these people probably would have improved themselves after all these years. It's not. Miss Misato, I want to take half of the burden off of you. Doing that means you're going to fight Gendo Ikari. I want to. I want to settle this for myself. Oh god, it's embarrassing. This dub's probably one of the most interesting dubs I ever heard in my entire life. And when I mean interesting, I mean really, really bad. Like most of the voice cast sounds like they're very inexperienced. Miss look alike? Sounds like she's got some skeletons in her closet. You sure it's okay to have her join us? That or they're very, very rusty. Like Keith Olsen was horrible at this. I have no right to hold such qualification which can trigger the rites of doom. We'll bring an end to all this chaos once and for all. Now launch! Now launch! Hey, who's he? I don't know. Which, to be fair, it's most likely the fact that she isn't used voicing this version of the character. But comparing her to her Japanese counterpart, yeah, I don't think she's doing a good job here. Spike Spencer isn't too bad. I'm not protecting anything. Actually, I destroyed everything. I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want anyone to come here. But he sounds more like a parody of Shinji rather than actually sound like Shinji. Here, help secure some food for us. No, I've never done it before. I can't do it. I didn't do anything. I sat through his entire screenplay. You sat through it? Yes. D did you want me to weep with joy? It's terrible. Now, I'm not saying he's a bad person. He seems to be a very nice guy. For me, getting back into that character with so many different nuances, they're not that that varied, though. I mean, it's, it's really, everybody knows, oh my god, Shinji's whining again. Yeah, but he still gets in the robot people. So, he still fights. Uh, and that's when, when people say, oh, he's such a wimp and a whiner and blah, blah, blah. He's like, yeah, but see, courage is to feel the fear and do it anyway. So he's a hero. And people don't get that. I'm like, aha! Suck on that. So I have nothing really anything against him. I'm just not a fan of his version of Shinji. It's all it is. Amanda Wen Lee <laughs> isn't too bad as Ray. What should I say? Thank you. Thank you. But it's honestly one of the easier jobs. Like, I could do a voice like this. Being calm, gentle, have no emotion in my voice. Which is something that anyone can do. Even I can do it. And I suck at talking. And yes, this also applies to Megumi Hashibara. Thank you. 
Arigato. Though, to be fair, I would consider her a better voice actress. <laughs> As the rest of the cast, yeah, it's not really something to write home about. Some of them felt okay. Hi, hey, Karin, it's been a while. It's me, Ida. Kensuke Ida. A lot of it felt mediocre. I mean, the captain didn't neutralize him when he last escaped. At this point, my faith in her has hit rock bottom. Jesus fucking Christ, that's terrible. It's not all bad, though. John Swayze and Tiffany Grant do feel like they're actually trying. And Domin Mills is actually a pretty good voice for Karu. The ties that bind you will show you the way. We'll meet again. And again, it's not really the actor's fault here. And I'm pretty sure they did their best. Good job. What I think comes down to is poor direction. Keep in mind, Kara are the ones that handled the English dub, and they're a Japanese company. And given the fact that English was not their first language, Kara here. Yes, I seem to have glided off target. It looks like I'm in a school of some sort. What? Yeah, you can see where the cracks are. Now, in all fairness, I can understand what Dan, or at least Kara, was trying to do. Having a translation that's faithful to the original source material as possible is something that I agree with. Altering the original translation from the original source material is a big pet peeve of mine. And no, the whole rumor about that new dub is all bullshit. Still though, was it really worth it for a dub that turned out to be not good? With a ton of technical issues? <laughs> Just want to tell you that the time of this recording is that we did find the original dub. Thanks to this guy, Zenbuster. He even saved the dub in both Archive.com and Mega. So I think it'd be good to shout him out for finding it. And we can finally hear what Asuka really said. Changed my mind. He's not an idiot. He's an asshole. Anyway, back to the plot. Ray looks at the baby and she thinks she's kawaii. <laughs> But then we get interrupted by Kensuke with some sake, which wakes up the baby. Kari breastfeeds the baby and pretty much tells Rei that she's her own person. Sometimes foreshadowing is relatively obvious. Kensuke can tell you try to let him eat, but he refuses to do so. Shinji-kun! So Kensuke, thinking that it would be for the best, decides to let him stay in his place for the night. I mean, if we're going to look at this in a surface level point of view, yes. But why are we talking about this when humanity surviving extinction again is just as significant, if not more? Look, I understand that the point is that not all things were that bad, and it's not a total disaster. But out of all the things you could bring up, that's the example you could come up with? I don't know. I guess it's much more important to let him know that they got together instead. We then see Kensuke's home, and we discover that Shinji's in hell. I mean, I don't know. You're the one who's flashing it. We then discover that Asuka also has a choker on. Shinji then proceeds to throw up. And it's not just for Asuka. Mario apparently has one too. And I know you're thinking. Wait a minute. You said that Shinji wore the collar because he destroyed the world. What are you retarded? Yes, but actually no. Because technically he didn't destroy the world. But technically he did. But technically he didn't. And technically he did. And he technically didn't. Let me explain. 
So what happened to 2.0 wasn't really his fault, but what he did cause was a domino effect that eventually caused things to went to shit. So what Karu said was technically right. ガフの扉を開いたエヴァ初号機はサードインパクトのトリガーとなってしまったリリンのいうニアサードインパクト全てのきっかけは君なんだよお花見を助けたかっただけだそうだねしかしそれが原因だよ but the problem was the movie wasn't clear whether or not it was his fault or not. Like, was it Karu or was it Shinji? It didn't help that the evidence we got was very contradictory. I am so confused right now. However, in Fries, we do get an explanation of what happened. <laughs> So it does make sense, even if it was an accident. Thank you! While it doesn't fix everything, it does at least fix that major problem from Free Pot Out. And there's at least an explanation. I even like how they explain the colors of the Willy Pilots, making them more of a common thing rather than being only for Shinji. And while it is cruel, it does make sense. Remember, Willy's goal is to save the world from Nerd. So it makes more sense for them to have the collars just in case this shit happens again. Since Ava pilots do have the potential to destroy the world if they go beyond their limit. Which is evident in 2.0 and near the end of the film. Given what Avis could do in this continuity, it is better to be safe than sorry, even if it is cruel. And yes, while it is a retcon, it does actually make sense to the story. Retcons are not always that bad. They can work if they make sense to the story. Now, I'm not saying that retconning is always a good thing. What I am saying is that retcons can work if you write it well. It's all about the good old execution. Now you might be wondering why is Asuka out of all people living here and not the village? Well it's kind of complicated but here's the answer. That's right, Asuka got infected by the angel and now she's an amorous. And apparently she can't even eat or sleep, she can only drink water. <laughs> That's horrible! Like she can't eat, sleep, or even have normal interactions. I mean, it's a fate worse than death. Like, Jesus Christ, this girl can't catch a fucking break. So anyway, after a few moments of the movie, Asuka pretty much snaps and beats the shit out of Shinji, and she pretty much force feeds him. Asuka, is that a good idea to try to force feed him like this? Especially when he's vomiting? I mean, wouldn't he choke on his own vomit? Now, you might be noticing that the animation's a little bit different here. First off, no, this isn't rotoscoping. It's known as previs, and it's been used for a lot of live action films. It's very rarely used for animation, especially anime. Supposedly, Otto wanted to use previs to get more ideas for better shots. And it's not the only film that does this, and it's actually much older than you think. Even animation has done this. I did it as a guide to photograph Marge Belcher, later Marge Champion, as Snow White, seeing her dance because she was a dancer, and seeing her move, and seeing her interact with the dwarves who were played by various people there at the studio. And they shot that live action, and they used it as a guide. They did the same thing for the man who modeled for the witch, who was an actor by the name of Don Brody. And he put on <laughs> the nose and had this cape-like thing and was used as the model for, we call her the witch, but she really wasn't a witch. She was this old hag. So what Otto is doing is not anything wrong, and it's actually kind of interesting. So what's the issue? Well, it's barely noticeable. In fact, if I didn't look at the behind the scenes footage, I wouldn't think that would have been the case. I mean, the entire thing would have been storyboards regardless, and nothing would really change. 
But I think the biggest issue is that Anno is focusing more on the shots and angles like a live action movie rather than treat it like animation. Which isn't really bad per se, but given the fact that Storyboards has done this before, why waste all the time and effort when Storyboards would have been just as effective? In fact, he could have done something like rotoscoping if he wanted to, which is a big missed opportunity in my opinion. Like, I can understand that animation is hard, even in anime, but I think it would have been kind of cool if they actually did the entire movie like this in this pseudo rotoscoping type of way, rather than focusing on the shot. Not to say focus on shots is a bad thing, I think it's a good thing, especially when you take the idea from Shin Godzilla. Regardless though, the entire thing probably backfired anyway, since we do see traditional storyboards in the behind the scenes documentary, and again, the movie had to be rewritten from scratch. <laughs> Oh, for God's sake! So, for all we know, this movie would have been a mixture between previs and traditional storyboards. Like some kind of goddamn chimera. And it makes me wonder, at the end of the day, was it really worth it? Was it really worth all that time and money? With animation that would have been good with storyboards anyway? Nope. Now, I would say you put a grain of salt in this wound. Because for all I know, Otto wanted to experiment to see if it actually worked. And to be fair, the results are pretty good. The animation's pretty solid, even some of the shots look pretty good, and do remind me a lot of Shin Godzilla. And maybe he was right. Maybe this was a better way to get better shots and better angles. <laughs> and maybe the entire thing was worth it. However, while I am an optimist, I'm also a pessimist. And I think he wanted to do that because of Shin Godzilla, rather than thinking that it would have been a good fit for even Gelly. Also to play with some toys. So anyway, Asuka tells Shinji that he's a piece of shit. What are you doing with your life? You're dirt to me. You're disgusting. You're fucking sick. Fucking end it all. Fuck you, I hate all of you. And Shinji does his iconic running away shtick. He then finds a place that was once Nerve HQ, so he decides to stay there for the time being. And while we're on the subject, can we talk about the fact that Pin Pin is able to make his own species with only one individual? <laughs> So how come there's more of him? Did he pull a Jurassic Park? Did he make babies out of that? No, you need two pen men to do that instead of one. So, are these just clones then? Did he pull off a Godzilla 98? Or was it a Shen Godzilla? Wrong floor. I can understand there's like different species of organisms that can reproduce by themselves. Even some bird species can do this. But there really is no evidence of penguins doing this. Let alone him. So how the fuck can he do this shit? And yes, I know he's a genetically modified penguin, but even then it's from the manga. So I'm not sure that really counts. But even so, let's just say he can do this. It was genetically designed to reproduce asexually. But if that's the case, how come we don't see any more pen pens from 2.0, or even 1.0 for that matter? Well, whatever. It doesn't really matter anyway, because the movie doesn't really explain this thing anyway. So there really is no point. So, I don't know. Life finds a way. Yeah, it's a really good idea to take shelter under these rocks, especially when it's affected by wild penguins. Guano is excrement produced specifically from bats and seabirds. Poop, including the 18 species of penguin that waddle around the southern hemisphere of our planet. Many species of penguin including Humboldt penguins use guano to build their nests. They scrape out layers of soil and poo using the claws on their feet to create burrows. These burrows offer protection for themselves and their chicks from the elements and any potential predators. So, while Shinji's moping in his own sorrows, we see Rei adapted well to her new setting. And it's honestly one of the best parts of the movie. This right here is my favorite thing, ever. In the history of forever. I do actually appreciate the film for making a nothing character into a character that we actually kind of care about. And the reason why is because we see this character grow. Ray Q was specifically designed just to follow orders because she was raised as a tool for nerves, similar to a robot. <laughs> but in 3.0, she questions her own existence on what is she? <laughs> Ayana 
and ironically, Shinji was probably one of the reasons why she changed. And thankfully, Thrice does indeed follow that idea, and to great effect. And it makes sense since she has the mentality of a robot, or a child, and has never really seen a group of people before. So to understand this, she decides to learn all these new ideas and concepts by learning new things. So it does make sense why she'll be curious, and she is learning new things that make us follow that character more. <laughs> And it's because of the fact that this ray slowly learns what it means to be human. Kind of like a fish out of water store. Now compared to her other counterparts, Angie Ray seems like they didn't know what to do with her and only becomes more interesting when she becomes Ray 3. And come to think of it, the Ray from 2.0 didn't really do that much either. Yeah, to be fair, she does some things. But it was kind of lacking at best. And I think it's because of the fact that this Ray died and never had a chance to do any of that. In Thrice, they do actually explore a lot more here than in 2.0. And not only that, it's actually well executed. And here's another example that's worth mentioning. <laughs> そう。you see, despite Asuka telling the truth, she doesn't really mind, and goes with the flow anyway. It really shows the part of the movie that makes me like Rei as a character. And she was a low-tier character at best, so that is saying something. So anyway, Rei gives Shinji some rations, so he won't starve to death. We then see Shinji eating while crying, indicating that despite wanting to die, he still wants to live at the end of the day, and Asuka does occasionally check on him to see if he's alright. Uh, I wasn't looking at anything, uh, I just happened to be walking by. It'd be creepy to know where you live, Baka. Back in the village, we see Toji and Kensuke talking about whether or not Shinji will even return. Shinji, I don't know about that, guys. Unless you mean wild animals in the woods. I highly doubt that Shinji's in danger. And also cold hearted? I mean, you guys have been the nicest people that Shinji has met thus far. What the fuck are you talking about? Anyway, Rei talks to Shinji, and this is the point that Shinji finally talks in the film. <laughs> These hands weren't meant to create! They only destroy! I can't look at them! So because of that, Shinji finally lets go all of his emotions and cries. <laughs> Because of that, he has a morality boost and is finally able to get back to the story.
動けるようになったんだったらケンケンの役に立て Excuse me, what? Anyway, Shinji and Ken Ken go out the forest so they can fish. Dame da yo, yatta koto nai shi. Boku ni a muri da yo. I i kara, yatte kara ie. But oh no, I didn't catch anything. I mean, what were we doing yesterday? Fun. No, that was not fun. You were shoving me up your ass. Yeah. We do get some exposition from Ken Ken about the world, and it's essentially the same thing I said to you earlier. And it does actually explain a few things. What is not explained is this. Now, despite the lengthy description, they are only used once in the film and they are never used again. So, what's the point of it? And for that matter, what happens if they get one of those headless Avas? We know that headless Avas are essentially humans and animals merged together. So, what happens if that thing hits a headless Ava? Do they turn to dead bodies or something like that? And for that matter, why is it only in just Japan and not everyone else in the world? How come Paris doesn't have headless Avas? I don't know, it seems like a Japan problem and a worldwide problem. Hi, it's me again. I should let you know that they actually did release the prequel called Evangelion 3.0 minus 46 hours. Hey, I'm not the one who makes the titles. And those Wanderer things do have a purpose because they're the ones that do spread the L barrier. There is more to it, but I'd rather talk about that later than now. So we'll cross that bridge eventually. Now, despite the massive amount of protection, they apparently don't have much time before it gets deactivated. But despite that, everyone is still carrying on hope for the best. We then see Rei and Akari talking some more, and Akari wants to let Rei stay here forever. <laughs> However, this being Evangelion, it turns out she can't stay here for long, and she'll die because of it. So, I can't stay here I'm going to die! Anyway, Toji didn't tell Shinji some advice that'll be very useful later on. Toji and it makes sense for Toji to say this, since he is a doctor, and they don't always save everybody, but they do take responsibility. And it makes sense for Shinji to learn this from him, especially for his character. What does not work is the scene with Ken Ken. Ken-ken. Wait! Nice message and all, but did they forget that Gendo's part of the bad guys? And it's actually trying to destroy what you're doing? Ah! Look, at least with their reactions to Shinji, I can understand. While it's true that Shinji did cause what he did, at least it was an accident and his goal wasn't to destroy everybody. He was trying to save everyone, especially Rei. <laughs> but Gendo is trying to destroy the world. Like, he caused Third Impact, or at least Selei. And it's not even a personal thing either. It's a problem with the character. Why is Ken Ken talking about Gendo when he is one of the main reasons why the world went to shit? It's not even an accident. This is actually intentional. I can understand it's all foreshadowing for the final act. And I can also understand it's all about father and son, which is nothing really wrong with that. But they could have done this scene better. If Shinji mentions about how was Kensuke's dad, and he said that he was a jerk, but then he regrets not talking to him that much, and wishes that he spend more time with him. I have a lot of catch up to do with my dad. <clears throat> Good throw, son. That's my boy. Go on, buddy. Oh, you're a great dad. Yippee! Farewell. 
You can even still use the phrase that father and son are still bonded or whatever. And by doing so, it inspires him to go and confront his own dad before it's too late. And I can understand it's supposed to inspire him to meet with his dad, just like how Toji inspires him to be responsible and become a hero. But with this scene, all I can see is Ken Ken being a pea brain. Fucking smart. Well, I made a bit of an oopsie there. What I was trying to say is that Ketsuke fell out of character when he was talking about Gendo. But what I failed to realize is that for one, Ketsuke is probably the nicest out of all of Shinji's friends. And two, this is a different version of the character anyway. So it doesn't really matter. So in retrospect, it does kind of make a little sense. Especially when he's confronting Shinji about his father. I think one issue is that like, well, he's treating the situation as nonchalantly as possible. When in reality, it was a big disaster. I understand there's people that have different ways of thinking in certain situations. But yeah, this feels kind of jarring. I also failed to mention that Asuka kind of feels out of character in this scene. She's treating the situation as normal, even though they're talking about Gendo. And she's part of the side that's trying to stop Gendo. So why is she talking about this subject anyway, when we know what she actually feels about it? If anything, it kind of makes her out of character. And the scene would have made more sense if Shinji was the one talking than Asuka. Just change it a little bit for the script and you'll have a way better scene. If anything, the moment should have been about those two instead of her. There's still issues with that scene, but still I kind of fucked it up. Kind of wish I was a little bit more clear what I was trying to say. And to be honest, I kind of wish I talked more about Asuka instead of Kensuke. But eh, what are you gonna do? Anyway, back to the review. Anyway, after a scene where Rei dresses up in her iconic school uniform. We then see Shinji and Ken Ken meet a guy doing experiments for the L Density Barrier. No, you did not misread that. This is actually Kaji Jr. And no, he is not that important. In fact, he never really comes up here again. This is the only time we see him physically. I mean, yeah, we see some photos here and there, but that's it. He's just gone. He feels like a character that should have been cut from the start, but he does technically serve a purpose in the story. You see, Kaji did sacrifice himself in order to stop the third impact and died because of it. Masada was going to join him, but it turned out she was pregnant with Kaji Jr. and couldn't do so. And I know what you're thinking. What the hell? Misato and Kaji had sex. How the fuck did that happen? Let me put it in a language you can understand. Hey, Vsauce, Michael here. I guess it's not out of the question they will have sex eventually, but but you assume they'll use some condoms. Uh, what went wrong? Either something went wrong with them, and those are not good condoms, or maybe something else happened. Wait. What? Where's your condom? The fuck's a condom? In all fairness, it does at least explain a little bit, but you still could have cut this out from the start. You could even change the reason why she stayed behind, because she's the only person that's capable of commanding an entire rebellion against Nerf. But doing this does not make him an actual character, it only makes him a plot device. Especially if you don't use him that much. So what is the point of Kaji Jr. if you're not going to use Kaji Jr.? So anyway, Rei discovers that she's slowly dying and decides to leave Toji and Akari's house with a note. Oh, yes. She then meets with Shinji and explains to him that she can't stay here for much longer, even though she would rather live here and be happy. And thus, Rei finally accepts her fate. Despite her dying, at the end of the day, what mattered to her was that she was happy. And she would rather die in happiness than live in her life without even knowing what happiness is. Which honestly is a great way to end her character arc. And thus, her arc ends with a satisfying death.
What? Oof, that's another person's change he lost. This kid never catches a break, does he? Let's sure hope he gets better soon. Wow, that was fast. Maybe a little too fast. Now this scene was criticized by a lot of people. Well, for one, being abrupt. And secondly, it was the fact that a person with PTSD would do the opposite effect than what Shinji did. Which, although I do agree with to a degree, I don't think that's the actual problem here. No, what I think is the real problem is that there's no motivation for him to be a hero again. Or in this case, him riding the Eva again. Here are some examples. If you've seen Mobile Suit Gundam or any other Gundam series, you probably know what I'm talking about. Amuro Ray has obvious case of PTSD, and he does occasionally run away, but he does indeed come back once he realizes that everyone's in danger. I'm going to kill you, and then kill you again. Nope. I'm not like that! That, and to settle the score with Char. In fact, his rivalry with Char is probably one of the main reasons why he grew as a character. Char! Or Noriko from Gunbuster. Despite having PTSD from earlier, she realizes that crime won't get her anywhere. And because of that realization, she decides to drive the Gunbuster and become a badass. Even in NGE, Shinji has done this before. In that, Shinji decides to quit being an Ava pilot for what he did to Toji. But once he realizes that everyone's in danger, he decides to go back to the Ava to save everyone. Gotcha, bitch. Here's the thing, all these characters had a realization. They realized that doing nothing's not gonna solve them anything, and they decided to go back and keep fighting despite the problems they have. In other words, they have the courage to keep on fighting. The reason why the scene in Thrice is so bizarre, cause Shinji here did not go for that realization. It just skips. The problem isn't that he has PTSD. The problem is that he has no epiphany and no realization that he needs to stand up and become a hero again. Even 2.0 did that right. <laughs> Granted, they do give us some hints. The fact that he has the Walkman and his eyes are apparently red after crying. Even so, it's a blink till you miss it moment. And besides, it doesn't really explain it properly, which could be the main reason why a lot of people got confused. I am so confused! But what I think they were trying to do is have Rei give Shinji some motivation so he can get into the Ava again. Which, I don't know if that was a good idea in the first place. Like, yeah, I get it, Rei found humanity, and I guess that's some motivation for him to get back to the Ava. But wouldn't that have the opposite effect? And even if it didn't work, Shinji probably would have given back to Eva with anger and vengeance, rather than him taking responsibility and becoming a hero again. Which kind of goes against the whole theme of the movie. Well, we're bone! But even then, I still think this scene could have worked if Shinji had some kind of epiphany. Like, gee, I don't know, his experience during his time during the village? Maybe that could motivate him. You could even have an inverse scene of 3.0, but instead they cheer him on. <laughs> These are some ugly looking fish. Maybe we're near one of those toxic waste dumps. And yes, I know it technically did happen, but that's later on in the movie. It actually would have been better if Shinji had that scene here rather than later on. Look, the point is that Shinji should have some motivation to be a hero again, and they somehow fucked that up. Which, I don't know why. It's not that hard to screw up. And honestly, it seems to me there's a scene missing. Especially when you consider the entire thing just came out of nowhere. I wanted to kill two hours. ずっと2時間切りたくて、なんか<笑><笑>
なのであのその時削るだけ削っていやもうこれ以上削れない足さなきゃいけないっていうものを足したんで、まあ、新エヴァに関してはもう足すシーンとかカットはもうないですかね I'm sorry, but you decided to make this movie less than two hours. But then you decided that wasn't possible, decided to make it over two hours. But you didn't realize that all these scenes that have been cut could have context of what's going on. And some of the scenes you did keep in are a big waste of time to the story. What the fuck are you talking about? So yeah, anyway, Shinji says, which Asuka replies with, Damn, Shinji got boofed. Not sure it's a good idea to point that thing in his face. So, anyway, Sakura is obviously upset at him for piling the aliens from the last film and has to be put in containment. And although he doesn't have the choker on, this time he's going inside a blast room. What's gonna happen? Am I gonna blow up? No, worse! It'll go right to your thighs! My thighs? And then you blow up. And they're authorized to shoot him if he escapes. Ah! I can understand that it's a safety precaution, but isn't this a little overkill? They already have choker bombs. They're also authorized to shoot Shinji when he escapes. Ah! Ah! So why are we having blast rooms? We then get to see Willy's base is in space now. And I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute, their base is in space now. Since when? And my answer would be, I have no fucking idea. <laughs> And to make it worse, they have the Wunder there in the base. Which I thought in 3 put out, they said this was our first time piloting it. <laughs> Or at least flying it. So, how in the hell did they get a space station? But then again, in 3.0, they had the ability to put Avis into space. Space! They seem to understand the technicals about it. And space was used before in 2.0, so it's not impossible they have a space station up there. Or at least stole a base from NERF. So I guess it makes sense. Thank you! Anyway, you get to see the Willy crew having some lunch. Mmm, good! While they're eating, they discuss what Masato did in 3.0. Mission failed. We'll get him next time. While the rest of the crew is still loyal to Masato. She, however, has a healthy dose of skepticism. Which does actually make some sense. Someone should be skeptical on what she did in 3.0. And it makes sense for this character because she has the most hate and spite towards Shinji. And her being angry at Misato instead of her just blindly following authority. Makes sense. So, after a couple of moments, we then see Misato looking at some kind of block looking thing. You know, there's a little detail I actually do like in this scene. That one of the vaults actually says watermelon. And we know that Kaji has been known to water watermelons. It's a very subtle way to show her grief. However, the next scene really is. Oh, this is just exposition for the audience. And I know what you're thinking. Hold on, you said that the last one was shit because they didn't explain anything. But now you're complaining that they're explaining things? You fat hypocrite. Well, the thing is, I don't have a problem with exposition. <laughs> because to me, exposition is just a tool for telling the story. And the tool can be done well or done quite poorly. <laughs> and a lot of media has done this right before. And that includes anime, like a character who knows a subject that explains what's happening, or an inner monologue, or even a flashback doesn't really bother me. But what does bother me in this scene is that it's not really for the characters, it's for the audience. Ritsuko should already know this shit by now, especially after 14 years. Ritsuko, why are you telling me the function of the wonder again? I already know this shit for the last 14 years. Misato, 
This conversation isn't for us. It's for the audience that are still confused from the last film. Oh, that's disappointing. I thought we were gonna do some more character work. Anyway, let's explain what the Wounder is and the function that it was made for. And what makes it worse is that they already did this before and it actually worked. When the Willy guys are talking to each other, they're just having lunch and just eating like normal. It explains to the audience and it keeps the plot going. I'm gonna win! <laughs> But here, it sticks out like a sore thumb. I can understand that Ritsuko is basically Fuyutsuki for Visato, since their characters are just the same thing anyway. But they could have done this scene better. I know it sounds strange, but they should explain this to Shinji while they're at the phone. Indicating that you still want to talk to him, but they're not quite there yet. Plus, you could say all the exposition you want to your heart's content. It's a win-win. It not only makes sense for the characters, but it makes sense for the story, and it makes sense for us, the audience. I mean, there's gotta be a better way. This modern touch is perfect for entertaining guests and showing off your aesthetic taste. Just make sure not to get it around the eyes. It tends to be a little spicy. Now, despite my complaints, I do think Masada is done way better here than 3.0. Apparently, Masada felt guilty putting all the blame on Shinji's shoulders and actually felt that she should have been the one that should have been responsible instead of him. <laughs> Which explains everything. Because in 3.0, it made her look like a bitch. What a bitch. And after looking at it thrice, I could see what they were trying to do with Misato. They were trying to make her a captain that's cold and heartless, but in reality has a heart of gold and does care about the people that she loves. But in 3.0, it was the opposite. <laughs> it made her cruel and heartless, and also very stupid. Hey pal, you just blowing from stupid town? In fact, I thought that she was going to be the villain of the movie. Like the whole trope being like, I'm doing this for the benefit of mankind, but in reality has secret motivations. It didn't help the fact that she looks like Gendo, talks like Gendo, has an evil sidekick like Gendo, does questionable things like Gendo. Even lost a loved one like Gendo. Coincidence? I think not! But then I found out that Masada was supposed to be a reference to Captain Nemo from Nadia in the Secret of Blue Water. Now I'm gonna try to keep this short, because it's really not that important to the review, plus it's long enough as it is. But for those of you who don't know, Nadia was one of the shows that Otto made before even Evangelion. Well, sort of. Technically speaking, the idea came from Hayao Miyazaki. <laughs> Which will eventually become Future Boy Conan and Castle in the Sky. However, Gunnix had the rights to do the show with NHK and Toho. However, like even Galen, Nadia's production was fucking chaotic. In fact, it's probably one of the main reasons why Otto became depressed. Though, to be fair, there were other factors. But if it weren't for Nadia, Evangelion probably wouldn't even exist at all. And there is a lot of connections between Nadia and Evangelion, similar to how Marathon has connections to Halo, even more so in the rebuilds. And that includes both Masato and Nemo. There are some differences though. One being that Nemo has more development time, though that's more the fact that it's a series and not a movie. But the biggest difference is, well, Nemo's not that big of a dick. 
okay, he's kind of a dick, but the way they betray him concerned his character does make sense. But in 3.0, we didn't know much about Masato other than she's a- Don't say it, Cartman! Wait. Don't do it, Cartman! Wait. In fact, we barely had any screen time with her. But in Thrice, you can tell that they were trying to improve Masato from 3.0 making her more sympathetic, having more time with her, and actually make us understand more about her character. I think she was pulled off quite well. If anything, out of all the rebuild characters, I think she was one of the best. Now I would like to talk more about Nadia, since I did watch the show for more context. But like I said, I want to keep this as brief as possible. And I think it would be for the best if I did Nadia for a future review someday. But if you want my overall thoughts about spoiling it, let's just say that Nadia wasn't as lucky as Evangelion. So after all of that, we see Gendo and Fuyutsi dragging the Black Moon. Now I know what you're thinking. Okay, so this movie solved Vil's resource problem. So does that mean that the film solves Nerve's resource problem? Good question. Anyway, we see Fuyutsuki tell out their plans for intermutality. <laughs> Now you might be wondering, given the fact they cloned Rei again, does that mean they have an entire army of clones this time? They don't. We were so close! They just cloned four, probably for those other Avas, I guess. Look, I understand they have the dummy plug system and there's no need for a pilot, but why not use this technology to your advantage? Like maintenance and communication and strategic planning? Like actual organizations? You have countless Evangelions. Why not make countless rays? Next, you're gonna tell me you had this idea from the very start. <laughs> Now this is all concept art for 3.0 in the Blu-ray version of 3.333. A stupid name. <laughs> Apparently, the original idea was to have clone rays, which actually makes a lot more sense how Nerve operates. But it begs the question, why scrap it? Like some of these ideas have more context than the actual movie. Yo, holy shit, he dead! Well, I do have a theory on what happened. However, I would advise you to put a grain of salt in that wound. Oh damn it! Oh damn it! because I could be wrong on what really happened. However, it is the most likely scenario. Remember when Otto said that he cut things out to make it shorter? I have a feeling he did the same thing here with 3.0 to make it shorter. It could be the main reason why 3.0 was the shortest out of all of them, because the biggest weakness was that it was way too short for its own good. That and it felt like Otto was running out of ideas, which given how the production went, that explains everything. Either way, it's hard to really know for sure, since there's barely any behind the scenes material for 3.0 anyway, besides the concept art. But at least with Thrice, we do got some material to hypothesize with. I know it's not a lot, but hey, at least it's something. Now despite some similarities, the concept art is very different than the 3.0 that we got. And look at the concept art is very interesting. Well, for one, the setting of Nerve would have been more like a beehive, and their Evangelions would have been born from that. And I assume all the raid clones would have been drones, kind of like bees or ants. Yeah. Ugh, another insect. How depressing. And apparently Nerve also had their own version of the Wunder, and they probably would have been more like dragonflies. And the Wunder probably would have been more like a sci-fi version of Noah's Ark. The Wunder at one point even carried biomes in these little bubbles. It was even going to have white blood cells, which look a lot like the mass production Avas. Even Ava 13 looks a whole lot different. And although it looks like a gun buster, it kind of reminds me more of the Turn A Gundam, or even the Turn X, or simply just making a reference to the original concept art of Ava Unit 1. And supposedly, it was supposed to be controlled like a piano, which makes that piano seem more of a setup than what we eventually got. In fact, the entire movie is pretty dark. There's a lot of blood, gore, tons of violence. Even Karu's death was much more graphic. We even see an Ava zombie apocalypse. There's a lot of body horror to match it up. Very similar to End of Ava. It's not just physically, mentally it's also pretty much a nightmare. 
Even some of the characters are probably much more different. Like, Genda here looks more like Liquid Snake. But given how he looks, he probably is much more insane. Kaji may be alive, but he's more than likely enemies with Misato, given the fact he's only present at Nerve. And it might be possible that Kara betrayed Shinji. And speaking of which, Shinji here probably has the biggest breakdown in the entire series, probably even more so than Enda Eva. He even has a nightmare of his own dead mother. A lot of it's pretty fucked up, actually. Even so, I think some of these ideas should have stayed in. Don't you think that some of these ideas are actually kind of important? To at least explain what the hell's going on? Yes! Not saying all of them, but at least the ones that make the most sense. Now, if some of these ideas did eventually became true in Thrice, like the book room, the Wunder being like an arc, even Nerve having evil versions of the Wunder is actually present here. But a part of me wishes that I live in a different timeline where this hypothetical 3.0 did happen instead of the one we got. But on the other hand, given the way 3.0 turned out, it probably ain't that good. Anyway, Gendo and Fuyutsuki are planning to start out the final impact, but by doing so, it falls into Sele's scenario. Oh shit, here we go again. Back in the Wunder, Ritsuko tells Masato the bad news. This is a big- Ritsuko tells Masato that Ava 13 is about to be reactivated and they have little time to spare. While everyone's getting ready for the final mission, we found out a little bit more about the rebellion against Nerve, we got some foreshadowing, and we finally get to see Asuka and Mari's new plug suits. And I know it's an aesthetic criticism, but I'm not really a fan of the white. I like the little rainbow coloring within the stripes, but I don't think white really works for Asuka and Mari. It really works best with Rei, really. If anything, black would have been a better choice, though it might be because of the fact that Rei also wear black. But then again, she also wear white too, so what's the point of that? Anyway, both Asuka and Mara take a detour to Shinji's cell. Sometimes foreshadowing is really obvious. Shinji then finds out why she punched him in the face in free part of So after all that, Asuka does tell him that she did like him and had a crush on him. But it's too late now. Because the fact that she's grown up, she's moved past him, and it's far too late for having a romantic relationship anyway. After they leave, we then see Shinji looking at Karu. He then tells Shinji, with sure confidence, Shinji says, so finally, we have the battle between Nerve and Willy. But before they do so, they send all the seeds out in escape pods, which I presume is a plan B, just in case they lose. But it doesn't really come up again until the very end of the movie. Seems to be another scene that should have been cut. So as they go to the South Pole, they cross an area that looks like ice, but they explain it's a high concentration of L barrier, and because of the anti-L system, they're able to go across through without being coronized. But as they cross, they then get attacked by the... Erlossing. Erlossing, yes. Sean Tootle. The Vunda tries to fight back, but because the Erlossing is finished, it has a better defense and attack. But because the Vunda was never finished, they have the superior speed to escape. While they're doing this, they get ambushed by the Ursabin? 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 Ow, bitch. Dick. That's not a word. So in order to get away, the Wunder rams into the other ship and make the Wunder bitch slap the Ursin Day. And because of that, it blocks the Urlossing's way. Now, this battle isn't about blasting each other, it's all about speed. And Willy's goal is to go to Nerve as fast as possible before Nerve ships catch up. 
and it's honestly a pretty good battle, instead of them fighting each other head on. The goal here is more about speed and headed towards the end point as fast as possible. It's actually not a bad idea, and they actually managed to pull it off. Thank you! And I actually do like the music here as well. The song is called Geki Taksu Goten Tai Daikamaten? Geki Totsu Go. Yeah, that. And it's from the 1977 Toho film, The War in Outer Space. And apparently, Otto took music from that, similar to how he did it with Shin Godzilla. This is technically a Toho film, so I guess he had permission to do so. And while I do like the music, I honestly think this song would have been a better choice. So the plan is to use those ships and make them as missiles so they can make a dent into NERV HQ. However, NERV's other ships are catching up to them, but they do manage to hit NERV and expose Ava-13. But like hitting a bee's nest, a swarm of Mark 7s come out and attack Willy. And we finally get a reason if NERV had defenses or not. And the answer is essentially bees. So, the next part of their plan is to use Asuka and Mari to skydive at them and charge a Nerve HQ. And the fight is... Well, it's a huge mess. Now, the CGI isn't that bad for anime standards, and the way they fall is kinda cool, but I think the big problem is that it's just way too busy. And I think the word that best describes it is visual noise, which reminds me of another set of films that does this. Now it's not just the fact that it's all CGI, nor is it just the fact that there's so much stuff in the screen, but it's more the fact that the enemies that they're fighting are just crap. Now let's compare this to Enda Ava. In that film, we get the mass production Avas. Although they do get beaten up, they still manage to put up a fight, and they were still a big threat. That and their design is very interesting, looking like harpies or angels of doom. But these guys from Thrice, well, they're just pushovers. And I'm not saying that they're all bad. I actually do like the idea of strength and numbers that they're going for. But the designs did not work for that purpose, and it makes them completely worthless. Maybe if they change the design to make it more like an arrow or a dart, that could work. Or maybe make it more like bees or wasps. You already have a cat even going, so why not bees? <laughs> They could even make new versions of the mass production Avas, and they could even make them more like a bird, and they could do a flock and attack that one. Like, I don't understand why would they change- There is one thing I wish I should have mentioned in my review, was that Ava Unit 1 was going to be some kind of plant hybrid, which is based on some kind of flower or something. But for some reason they scrapped it, and I don't know why. Which is a shame, because the idea is actually kind of interesting. Like, think of all the body horror potentially have with this. Now, for all we know, we don't know the exact reason why they scrapped the idea, which could be anything. But, if they can have a cat Evangelion, then why not a plant Evangelion? The potential is right there. Do some crazy shit with it. If there's one thing I give the film credit, is that they scrapped Unit 8 plus 2, and just upgraded Unit 2 and 8. Not only did the design didn't look good, and it also didn't have a good first impression, but it also didn't make much sense. Like, I thought Unit 8's orange just blew up. And wasn't Unit 2 just mincemeat? That makes no sense! Now in fairness, they were gonna make it more interesting. Like, it was going to be like a robot dinosaur at one point. And I believe the idea was inspired by Get a Robo of all things. However, according to them, the design did not work. And it would be better to have two Avas instead of one. Which, in hindsight, actually was a good decision. Not only does it actually make more sense, but they actually look kinda cool as well even make it a reference to Jet alone, which in turn is a reference to Jet Jaguar. 
Add your proof of that. Oh wow, a useful weapon. Better throw that away so it won't be used later. Let's make things harder for ourselves. So Asuka tries to destroy the entire swarm with her AT field. Obviously it didn't work, so thinking quickly, Mari and Asuka use both their AT fields together to destroy them all. Anyway, they get to the base, and they get attacked by arm units. Despite their silly design, they're surprisingly tough to fight. They can even blow themselves up kamikaze style. Which is fine and all, but if they could blow themselves up, why didn't they just blow up the head? I mean, the head is the weak spot. Asuka finally gets to Ava 13, and tries to stab with a giant pen, but oh no, it didn't work. What? So wait a minute, Unit 2 is scared of 13, but how's Ava to know this? Why does it even matter? And uh, and that's a good question. Why doesn't Ava 13 have an AT field? So confusing! Well here's the thing. Technically speaking, there are actually five atoms. There wasn't just four. And Ava 13 is actually the fifth atom, which explains why Mari says this in 3.0. And the reason why Ritsuko says this is because that is the actual body, which is essentially what they're piloting, a dead god. It's also the main reason why Asuka says this. <laughs> because these things are the actual core. And we also have to keep in mind that these things don't have an AT field. <laughs> so they work differently than regular Evangelions. But if that's the case, what are the Evangelions here then? Remember, all Evangelions are clones of Adam. <laughs> With the exception of Unit 1, which is a clone of Lilith. But in this continuity, we now know that they didn't spawn from Adam. So, what are they made of then? Do they all originate from Lilith then? Actually, that would make much more sense, since technically, Lilith is still an angel here. Also, given the fact that the term Lilith is still used in this continuity, I can accept it. But what does it make the angels then? Do they originate from the atoms, or are they completely different? Actually, what does it make Karu then? Is he even Adam this time? We do know that he's the first and last angel. But does he have Adam's soul? Actually, does Ray even have Lilith's soul here? If it's no, then why does Lilith look like Ray? And if yes, does that mean you can copy Lilith's soul? Now the problem isn't the fact that it doesn't follow the original lore. Keep in mind, this is all the Rebo continuity, so the rules are going to be a bit different. And I'm totally fine having new lore for this continuity. But I think the main reason why it's all confusing is that we're being force-fed this information here without us giving us a chance to understand it. Which is why I think a lot of people got confused. We're not showing this information properly, we're essentially being force-fed by it. Now, I'm not gonna say that NGE was perfect at this. If anything, the reason why it got better was from the director's cut. But at least with that, it wasn't force-fed to us. I don't understand it. James Coco went mad in 15 minutes. Anyway, it turns out it was a trap all along. It's a trap. No. You know what? That's it. I'm done. And Gendo's doing his own plan instead of Sailor's scenario. Masada and the crew try to stop him, but then they get stopped by the... The get bet. The get bet. Gerbe? Gebet. Mm, yes. And they use the Wunder to open the gates of Guff. So, without any choice, Asuka's level 999 becomes a giant kaiju and uses her own AT field to stop Unit 2's AT field. <laughs> Which, I got a question. If you use your own AT field to destroy Unit 2's AT field by making it more powerful, but wouldn't that also affect Unit 2's AT field? Wouldn't that cancel it out? Also, how the fuck did they put that thing in her head without killing her? Wouldn't that thing poke her brain? I guess that's the real reason why she says Lillian. I also love the fact that Unit 2's evolution is so out of place. We start out as a carnivorous humanoid, then a giant cat with a machine gun, and now we have a giant forearm kaiju thing. I mean, what is this, Digimon? But big shock, her plan did not work. 
and AV-13 gets revived anyway. Supposedly, Gendo wanted Asuka to become an angel so his plan could go through. Now, Gendo playing 4D chess is not really out of his character, but what if Asuka died earlier? Like, she almost died here, here, and here. What if she didn't get infected by the Amogus? What then? Do you have a plan B just in case? <laughs> Honestly, it feels like they added this plan in the very last minute. Probably because, well, it was. <laughs> Suddenly, Asuka goes to another dimension and sees another version of herself. Asuka says, Ha! I got a reverse card. But it turns out she had a reverse card too. It's not fair! And thus, Asuka dies. And I love the fact that nobody really cares. Well, I guess maybe Masato. And obviously Mari. But other than that, she doesn't really matter because she sucks in this film. Her death here only reminds me why her death in EOE was superior. In EOE, Asuka was in rock bottom and had nowhere else to go. Once she was in Unit 2, she finally had an epiphany and finally realizes that her mother was with her the entire time. When she dies, it's heartbreaking because we follow this character to the very end. And it's because that she was a developed character. Shiganami is not a developed character. What the fudge fickle? When Shiganami dies, there's no impact because we didn't know her story. There's only an illusion of one because this is another version of Asuka. I guarantee you, if this was like another character and she did the same thing here, nobody would really care because her character throughout these movies is absent. Now you might be thinking, Okay, so why is Asuka so different from the original? And why is Mari here at all? She seems to be more like an FLCL character than an Evangeline character. Well, you see, apparently this version of Asuka and Mari weren't really made by Anno. Mm. They were really made by Suramaki. Oh yeah, that's why. Now, I'm not going to let Otto off the hook yet, because after looking at the rebuilds, it would seem that he didn't know what to do with these characters. He is the writer, after all, and it's not to say that he can't. Midori is a good example of this. But you could really tell that they got the shit end of the stick. With one exception. In my last review, I said Mari was the worst character because she was a Mary Sue. And I honestly disagree with that statement now. For one, everyone tells Shinji the same thing anyway, and Avangel and Pilots are done differently here as well. That and she doesn't really do much here anyway. In fact, she's really just a nothing character in retrospect. Now, this isn't changing the fact that she's not a good character. I still stand by that. But at least she's no longer the worst character. What really is the worst character is just Shikinami. Like, I don't know what the hell they were trying to do with Asuka here. And I hate to say this, but at least with Mari, I can understand what they were trying to do with her. They were trying to make a character that was having fun piloting Ava and have a different take to the story. And while she didn't do much to the plot, at least her character was at least consistent. But with Shikinami, I don't know what the fuck they're trying to do with her. In 2.0, they try to make her more like a nicer version of the character. At least from my understanding. Because what I got out of it was that she was pretty much a loner. In 3.0, she was an adult trapped in a child's body. But despite how interested it sounds, they don't really explore it as you think. You're pointless. And in Fry, she's basically an angel. And I guess it's based on her having a disability? Like she lost an eye and can no longer do normal things anymore. But they don't do anything with the idea at all. It's just pointless. And I honestly think it's really just an explanation why she says Lillian and has a glowing eye patch. And no, I don't think they plan this from the start. And again, this has nothing to do with adaptation. I recognize that she's supposed to be a different version of the character. And that there are other series that actually do pull this off quite well. But what matters is, is the execution. And it stinks. 
Yeah, I know, I might be more biased because I actually do like Soryu more. But here's my question. Which one would you rather prefer? A character that's not only more developed, but has a reason why they act the way they do? Or a character that's basically just nothing? I'll let you decide. Anyway, things go in the real deep shit when the reconstructed Mark IX hijacks the Wunder again and uses that ship for instrumentality. Things get so bad that their power gets shut down and everything's offline. I see the problem. Oh, do ya! So now Willy are just sitting ducks and Gendo pays him for a visit. You gotta shoot. We then find out what Gendo meant in the last movie. Apparently he was playing everyone the entire time so he could finally make his own impact the additional impact. Wow! How original! Oh snap, Ritsuko shot first. Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. But then he gets back up and it turns out he needs no AT field because now he's a god. Or an X-Men. Render mutant. Of course. Not. So yeah, it turns out that Gendo has used the Nebuchadnezzar key, but by doing so, loses his humanity, but in turn, he has the knowledge of the gods. You know, I found it really hilarious that he put his own brains back in, even though he doesn't really need them anymore. You basically have the knowledge of the gods. What's the point of putting your brains back in? I mean, we gotta put the visual there somehow, I'll just do it. So anyway, Gendo's motivation is the same thing as before, but with a twist. His plan is to cast aside humanity and unite them and evolve themselves so they can have paradise. But by doing so, he has to kill the gods, which is why he betrayed Sele in the first place. <laughs> We then learn from Gendo that the reason why they chose instrumentality was a resistance against God. However, it didn't work in the long run, and Gendo seized the opportunity to kill the gods for himself, meaning that Sally pretty much died for nothing. And you fail! We then eventually find out that Gendo's plan is not just for Yui, but really for everybody. You see, while Gendo wants to reunite with Yui, his goal is to remove all AT fields so everyone can merge into one beam while also removing all the flaws of the human race. お前が選ばなかった so yeah, basically Gendo is Thanos now. And to be honest, that's pretty good. Not only was it an update for the character, but it was a good update for the character. And while his plan is insane, his goal is to make a world a better place for not just for him and his wife, but for humanity as a whole, even if Utopia does justify the means. Gendo in the original only had one motivation in mind, and that was just reunite with Yui, which even she didn't agree with, and pretty much cuck Gendo. But by doing this, it actually does improve the character's motivations. And it's done rather well. Thank you. But there is one little issue. Gandalf's plan is basically just Sele's. Nothing really wrong with recycling ideas, but as long as they do something fresh with it, I'll be fine with it. And besides, Sailor's motivation is also different. They're essentially going against God anyway. So there really is no problem here, except for one thing. Why did Sailor commit suicide? Why trust in Gento to make sure everything's going to plan? Especially when he's known to backstab. And why is that a requirement for instrumentality? Question. While on the topic of religion, does that mean the David Apocalypse theory is now debunked? <laughs> well, technically they got the story right, with a new horn coming out of nowhere, being Ava 13, which even though some details are wrong, that part is technically right. But on the other hand, I don't think the story was even used at all, because Genda also says that they're the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which is another story in the book of Revelation. 
これで全てのホースマンは揃った。And yeah, I know the book of Daniel and Revelation have some connection, but do you really think that Anna and the other guys really know that? Christianity is basically unknown in Japan. Not to mention that they actually admit that all the Christian elements are really meant for a style, and there really is no Christian theme. Think like how God of War or Hercules handling Greek mythology. Sure, it's their style, but there really is no Greek message. And the same thing goes to Norse, Egyptian, and even Japanese mythology. <laughs> And Judeo Christian religion is no different, and there's plenty other franchises that handle these Christian elements before. So, is it fair to say this was probably not their first idea? Not to say there wasn't any inspiration from it, but do you really think that Otto, the guy who's known as an otaku, had his very first idea from the fucking book of Revelations? Not even your god can save you. He already is. If anything, the idea probably came from Ultraman. Yes. Your mission is to save the Earth. Which not only is Anno a fan, but the guy who made Ultraman, Eiji Tsuburaya, was a Roman Catholic. So the real question is this: Which came first, the Bible or the Ultraman? It's Ultraman. Now it's not to say they didn't put any thought into it. I think they actually did. Like the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, which they seem to take inspiration from Mesopotamian art. Which, fun fact, all Judeo religions, like Judaism, Islam, even Christianity, all originated from. You can even see that Lilith took some inspiration from Ishtar. Well, not that one. There we go. So you can actually tell they did some research while making the film. And given the fact that Eiji Tsuburaya took his own religion as inspiration for Ultraman, which in turn Anna was also inspired by, it's entirely possible that Anna put more thought into the Christian elements during the film's production. But on the other hand, judging how the film was written in the very last minute, it's kind of doubtful they had a plan from the start. Actually, come to think of it, the entire cross thing that Masato had is totally gone now, and it might be because of the fact that, like Masato's dad, was kind of a jerk. 自らの仮説を実証した君の父上、カスラギ博士の提唱した人類保管計画だよ。父の世まいごとは必ず止めてみせます。I mean, to be fair, it makes sense, and I actually do like the fact they replaced with a handkerchief. However, it makes the entire thing with the cross totally worthless now. In fact, it never gets brought up again. Know your fucking place, trash. And actually, now that I think about it, the entire thing with both Freud and Yoon is nearly gone.、Mm. And for those of you unaware, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung are both psychologists that founded psychoanalysis. Now I mentioned these two because they did have some influence to even Galen, at least psychologically, which also includes *The Hedgehog's Dilemma*. So why do I mention this? Well, it's pretty much absent here. Not to say that it's not there. There is references to it, but they don't even bring it up at all. It's just gone, and it might be not by choice. How much you want to bet that they were going to put that element in the rebuilds, but they couldn't do it, given the fact that Freud got a lot of things wrong, and a lot of things he said were out of date. Hmm. Really makes you think. Ganda then shoots a laser at the Hindu and takes Unit One. So as Gendo leaves at Unit One, we finally get to see Shinji, and wow, that was quick. Look, I get the vault was unlocked, but how the hell he got up there so quickly? Like, isn't the Vunder a giant ship? I don't know. He took the stairs or something. <laughs> Anyhow, Gendo gets eaten by Ava Thirteen, merges with it, and takes Unit One to the gates of Gap, thus starting the additional impact. Well, it looks like you're fu- Oh, never mind. That was kind of convenient. Why do I even bother? Now, despite being blocked by the force field, some people just sit around since there's nothing they can really do. Who's Mr. Sunshine? However, some of them have hope, like Toji. Gahu's door is minus one. Unfortunately, Bill is blocked. 
保管計画を止めるすべはない万事休すね<笑>シンジー tells ミサトさんが背負ってるもの半分引き受けるよ。そのためには怒り言動と戦うことになるわよ僕は僕の落とし前をつけたい So after all of that Shinji accepts the DSS choker and finally accepts his responsibility ちょっとやめてよ冗談じゃないまさかエヴァに乗せるつもりじゃないですよねこんなことになるんじゃないかと思ってた艦長この状況なら無条件発砲許可でしたよね。あ、uh,、excuse me。I understand what you're going through。but he's wearing a collar that could potentially kill him。and he's about to sacrifice his own life and is willing to save the earth for your ass。what's the problem here。あんたの起こしたニアさんのせいで。私たちの人生めちゃくちゃよ。すべての謙虚。あんたら親子だけは。絶対に許さない。oh。I get it now。yeah。so what。No, no, 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 no. You can't play that game. If he's willing to sacrifice his own life for everybody, then there's no issue here. I don't care if he started or not. Why are we arguing about this again? Also, isn't everyone dying? Whoa, what? How did you get up here? Actually, how did everyone else get up here? Did they took the stairs like Shinji? <laughs> You're talking total hogwash. Really? That's the best you can come up with? Total hogwash? <laughs> So, Masato does a legal loophole and takes all the blame of Shinji Ikari onto her since he was under her supervision at the time. And because she's a guardian, she puts all the blame onto herself. And you know what? I did like the fact that Masato became a base mother by taking all the blame off of Shinji to her and taking the bullet for it. It's Evangelion tradition, I guess. But even then, why do a legal loophole when Shinji's risking his own life for everybody is proof enough as it is? Maybe this scene should have been later than earlier. Ah, I didn't expect that. I guess when you see a person permanently frowning, it's kind of jarring when they actually do smile. I'm smiling, isn't it obvious? No, it looks like you're trying to eat your own chin. So after a few more bits of drama. They finally accept that Shinji is the only one that could save the day. You know, I actually did like the fact that Midori is begrudgingly accepting Shinji because he's the only option they have left to save the day. It's not really a change of heart, it's something that she does begrudgingly, and it's still consistent throughout the entire film. Also, shout out to Sakura, becoming the very first Evangelion character that's a Yundere. Whatever happened to Till Death Do Us Part? It's no wonder that she became a meme in Japan. 
And I gotta say, the scene with her with the gun was absolutely hilarious. What a wonderful character. So as we move... Hold on for a bit. Hello. What, am I missing something? What do you mean, I got everything? What are you talking about? Oh yeah, that old controversy. From my understanding, a common complaint that everyone had was that the fan service was overkill and a lot of it felt inappropriate to certain scenes, most notably this one. I wanted to understand that side of the argument. Truth be told, I didn't really notice it till now. In fact, I only noticed it after watching some reviews. Now you know I love me some fan service, but I really like it when they manage to actually incorporate it into the story. This movie fails at that. Time for some surface level critiques. That's also something that I don't like about the rebuilds in general, the fan service he shots. Don't get me wrong. I like the booty. I like the titty. But when it comes after, or even during, a very emotional scene, it takes off a little bit of that emotional weight. The original series had its fair share of fan service, but it never felt distracting to the degree that the rebuilds do. One shot that is very, um, Vivid in my head is uh, the shot of Sakura sort of collapsing forward and it's shot from behind and like there's just like, you know, the you know butt is fully, you know, you see like basically up into the underside of the crotch, like the pubis mons, like that whole everything is just very front and center, very well defined, like it's like here's all the stuff. Now, this might be a difference of philosophy, but I'm the type of guy who's all for freedom of expression when it comes to art. And I'm against people restricting or censoring that. And while I do understand some criticisms, I really don't understand why this is a big deal. Or maybe I'm pretty much used to it at this point. Once you watch a lot of anime, your mind pretty much nullifies the fan service elements. And you pretty much don't notice it or don't even care. Not to say there isn't any valid points against it, but if you're like me, you probably wouldn't even care that much. I don't care. And besides, there's far worse examples out there, especially if you do care about this stuff. Trust me. Now you might be wondering. Okay, but why though? Why did Anno put in fan service when he absolutely hates it? Is he a giant hypocrite this whole time? Well, you see, I don't think he's really against fan service. What? Yeah, why don't you look at his other works? He has done fan service before, and even Gale is no exception. Though some would argue that it criticizes the fan service. Well, it used, mis you know, ob objectification and the male gaze, and it had misogynistic elements to it. It was a criticism. It largely encased that into, like, this is a teenage boy's point of view. He is a little misogynistic. Uh, he's going to have to learn to get over it. Uh, like, sort of deal. This is negative. And look, it's not like even Gillen hasn't criticized anime before. I think the end of the show perfectly sums anime in general. And probably it was ahead of its time. But given how Anno's track record has its fair share of fan service, yeah, I pretty much don't buy it. And it's pretty much reaching at this point. Hell, even Galen has its fair share of fan service merchandise. Stuff that Anno approved, by the way. Now you might be thinking, Okay, have you considered that Anno's opinion on fan service has changed over the years? Well, nice fucking try, because the recent stuff that he made had fan service. <laughs> In 2004, he made the film Cutie Honey, which is based on the manga by Gona Guy, which was actually one of the pioneers for the magical girl genre. And also fan service. Now, it's not that surprising since Gona Guy is notorious for sex and violence, with a dash of body horror. But here's my contention if Otto was really against fan service, then surely he should remove all this stuff. He didn't. And this came out in 2004, eight years after the end of Evangelion. If he was really against it, why would he make it in the first place anyway? And it's not like it did well either. It had to become a box office bomb. So who's to really say what his beliefs are? Now you might be thinking, Okay, Anno does have some fan service moments, but have you considered that his beliefs are different than his own works and his own business? Your personal feelings and economics are not one and the same. Which is true. I don't know much about Otto's personal beliefs. For all I know, he could think the opposite than what I said. However, here's some evidence that disproves that argument. Mm. <laughs> 
心の胸がいやらしかったです、うん、<笑>いやまあね私は胸の表現にえらいこだわってるし、ねうん、皆さんなんだかんだ言ってねヒロインのセックスアピールってちゃんとやってんだよね、うんまあ、特に胸ですそうそうそうというか胸しかないでしょ<笑>胸とくびれとしかそうそうそう、まあ、ここのね胸の揺れ戻しがなかなか素晴らしい、はいはいはいはい、Honestly it's not really that surprising Again he was inspired by Gona Guy and his works are pretty edgy and Anno even admits that he put a lot of elements from Gona Guy into Evangelion Why do you think he made the cutie honey movie in the first place? And it's not just Gona Guy All the other stuff that Anno likes has its fair share of fan service. Like Strike Witches, for example. So, does that make Anno a pervert? Not really. It's most likely a cultural thing at best. Japan is more open about sexuality than we do in the West. And to those of you who think it's all sexist, a majority of manga artists are actually women. And some of them do have sexual elements as well. So, it really, isn't that surprising that even Galen has these elements in the first place? Now, the big question is why? Why did Otto make something like this, but also something like this? Well, it's really more about tone and mood. You see, the tones of fan service scenes are usually more lighthearted. They're not really supposed to be taken that seriously. However, comparing this to the end of Even Galen, the tone is much more darker and serious. Therefore, it's the opposite mood. They're both completely different things. Just because this scene is put in a negative context doesn't mean he's against all porn. And I honestly think that people don't realize that, because Anno does have different types of moods in his work, and that includes humor. And even Gillian does have humorous moments, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and it also applies to his other works, too, like Kara Kano, for example, which is a romantic comedy anime. Hell, a director's mood can be different than what he makes or even likes. For example, when Otto was depressed in the 90s, the show they watched all the time was Car Ranger. Funny enough, when his depression returned after the production of 3.0, the show that he watched after that was Curianger. Though I think you should be skeptical about that source, since it's not really the best. However, it did mention that he liked Comrade Fives, Comrade Kabuto, and even Hurricaneger, which there is evidence that supports it. And who knows, there might be a shred of truth in there. Back to the point, a director having two different tones is not that uncommon. The best example is Yoshiyuki Tamino. <laughs> While it is true that the stuff he makes do get depressing, what people don't realize is that his filmography is not always like that. And he also has a sense of humor, even in his darkest works. Look, the point is that directors can have different tones in mind, and Anno is no exception. All things considered, I don't think that was their goal in mind. I honestly think that the way they shot it is most likely an influence from Shin Godzilla. That being said, I do agree that the way they shot it do make it look like it, which is a problem. However, I do not think that's their intention at all. So I guess everything's chill now, right? FBI, open up! <laughs> Anyhow, after the drama settles, Shinji finally gets his old suit back. How did Willie get Shinji's old suit? Who knows? They just had it the entire time. Probably because just for fan service, and not the kind you think. Although. Anyhow, Sakura dresses up Masato's wounds. <laughs> and sure enough, they finally get a heart to heart. What? The most a son can do for his dad is either A, pat him on the shoulder, or B, kill him. What the hell does that mean? Can you just love your dad, or hate your dad, or simply be indifferent on your father? There's plenty of ways to do with your dad than just those two options. And out of all people, 
Kaji thinks this was good advice. I guess Kaji went to the L barrier too much. So after all of that, Shinji and Masato finally make up, and Shinji joins with Mari and head towards the anti-universe. And I know you're thinking. Hold on, I thought that they said that the Wunder was incapable of going to the anti-universe, but Unit 8 is somehow able to. What the actual fuck? Well, it's actually kind of simple. The reason why Unit 8 is able to cross over to the anti-universe is because it's technically fused with the other units. Remember when I was eating Mark 9? It's not really eating it, it's actually fusing with it. It's the main reason why it gains extra halos. Because it's really absorbing their powers and using it against them. Think of it like how Majin Buu does it, or even like Android 21, though it's more likely a reference to Ultraman Taro, given the fact that Ava overlapping is a reference to Ultra overlapping, and that Ultraman Taro fuses with the other Ultraman to become Super Ultraman Taro. So it actually makes a lot of sense. It explains why she has a bigger power level, and why it's able to go to the anti-universe and why it grows a giant cat hand. Man, Otto really does like cats. Yeah. A little off topic, but I did notice this when I watched it again. Notice that there's like four raid clones and four Ava units for Nerve, and the movie does establish this. Now, given the fact that Mari ate them like a fucking animal, something tells me that they're not coming back. And surprisingly enough, they actually dodge a bullet when it comes to plot holes. Because in 3.0, you can't really destroy them because the entire thing's the core. But here, because they're actually fusing with it, it's actually not destroying them, but becoming one with them. It's the same reason why they say this in the end of the film. I'm sorry, what? So in a way, it does actually make sense. And a Thank you! However, it's very, 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 No, you don't! Convenient. Like, wow, if it weren't for that shit, we would've been fucked really hard. But you know what? I can accept it. I can accept that this thing is very convenient. I can accept that the portal still being open, despite one chip missing. Because you know what? Unit 13's in the portal, and that's happened the last time. I can even accept the fact that Gendo could've just blown up right there. Because you know what? That's not his plan. Willy has literally no options to get through the anti-universe. And even if they could, Gendo still has an instant transmission technique, so it's game over. But you know what I cannot accept and cannot let down? The fact that Shinji goes at Unit 1 for no fucking reason! How did- I just- did it! I would- And that's it. There's no explanation. It just happens for no reason. For no reason. So I guess it's because of Rei, I guess? And Shinji asked her to get inside Ava Unit 1, but but it also kind of happened out of nowhere anyway, and, and Gendo loses Rei, but it doesn't really matter because it's part of his plan. It also turns out that the Spear of Cassis was there the entire time. It turns out the one is the Spear of Hope, while the other one's the Spear of Despair. Sounds like a first draft name, by the way. Would it make more sense if it was called the Alpha and the Omega Spear? You know, the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning. The end. It not only sounds better, but it makes more sense thematically if you're gonna have biblical elements. Seriously, how about a game for children does the idea better than you do? And I guess the main reason why Shinji's able to find Avid Unit 1 is because the fact that he has a connection to it? Is it like a spirit thing? Is that the reason why Shinji's eyes are purple? I don't know. It's just confusing and I don't know what's really going on. Yes, you could say the same thing about pre instrumentality and end of Ava, but at least with that, I can understand what they were trying to do, since the entire thing felt like an illusion anyway. Not saying it was perfect, but at least with that, I can understand what was going on. This is just very confusing how it really works. I mean, basically, Shinji just goes to the anti-universe like it's a JRPG, and gets ready that way, with some luscious locks. Honestly, I don't understand why Shinji doesn't have those luscious locks. 
I mean, it's been 14 years. If Rei's hair gets longer, how come Shinji's hair stays the same? I don't know. But in the end, it doesn't really matter because none of it is explained anyway. It all just happens. For no damn good reason! Wait a minute. If they knew Shinji's synchro ratio was zero the entire time, why was that not an argument for him not getting into the Eva? Uh oh. Eh, it's over. We're done. I tried. It can't be saved. It cannot be done. It's over. It's game over, man. Game over. Into exile I go. Failed I have. I miscalculated. I tried so hard, it got so far, but in the end, it didn't really matter. If there's one thing the Reboots do really well consistently, it's the music. Shiro Sugisu, for those of you living under a rock, was the composer of NGE and EOE. But it's not just that, he also made music for Bleach, Berserk, Nadia, the Gridman series, and even live action works like Shin Godzilla and Shin Ultraman. The guy has a distinct style and even variety in his own work. For example, he uses an English choir a lot in his own works. He could put the music in the shittiest show ever, but there is something there to appreciate, at least musically. But while the choir is still there in Fry's, we get more variety of vocals here. For example, these two songs here while Ray and the rest are in the village. And also apply some more depressing songs, like this one from Masato, showing the character's grief and sadness. I feel like I am lost in a place that has no concept of who I am. Like a ghost between worlds, I am trapped and I'm losing belief in myself. We even get to hear songs that are previously cut like this version of Borderline Case. Apparently it was going to be used for Andy Evangelion, but for some reason they removed it. However, because you actually wanted to finish it, they actually reused this song for this movie. Though at a cost because they removed this song from the soundtrack. Hey, it's me from the future again. I just thought I'd let you know that the song is actually in the three proto prequel, though unfortunately it doesn't have the vocals. Well, that's unfortunate. It is nice they reused that song for something else. I guess you gotta make the most of it. Anyway, uh, back to the review. But on the plus side, the song actually does really work. Now, whether you like the rebuilds or not, we cannot deny that the soundtrack does sound fantastic. However, he's not always perfect. What? Take this scene for instance. Now, once you look at this scene without the music, what do you think? Well, it's usually something that's triumphant. The hero's back at his feet, and willing to fight the villain to save the day. But here's what they used. What the fuck? Why does it sound evil? 
When I first heard of it, I thought it was like an oh shit moment for another part of the movie, like Masada and the other crew being attacked by those other ships for example. But no, it's for this scene, and it does not fit. Granted, it gets better eventually. But why start off like this? It doesn't fit the mood at all. Not saying that contrasting tones can't work, Calm Sessor Todd is a good example. But the reason why that song worked was the fact that it has some elements that were melancholy. Even if it did sound a bit cheery. But here, the tone is just out of place. It's just a simple fact that the song is just unsuitable. Now I'm not saying that Shiro Sugisu doesn't know his music. I think he does, and he's really talented at it. It's just a case of a miss then a hit. We all make mistakes sometimes. <laughs> Now there are more examples of this I'll get to, however that requires me to spoil it too early, so we'll get there when we get there. Let me in. Let me in. Anyhow, Shinji and Genda are now in the anti-universe. Gendo explains that it's the world of the gods, and they were the ones that created the entire universe. So yeah, the far are not the guys that made this universe. Which is fine by me since it's a different continuity anyway. But hold on to your butts, because this is going to be a major mindfuck. <laughs> we then learn from Gen that this is all part of Shinji's memories, and the reason why they're seeing this is because their minds can't perceive the anti-universe. So the LCL makes a virtual environment for them. Well, memories and asterisks, because it really is no rules that it really follows. It's really just random stuff happening. Nothing really wrong with that since we're dealing with the human mind and imagination, and the entire thing's an illusion anyway. But I think it would have been fine if they just said the human conscious in general, not just his memories. The human mind is complicated after all. In all fairness, I'm gonna let this one slide, because we are dealing with the human conscious in general, and the entire thing's an illusion anyway. Sure, it wasn't the best explanation, but at least it's what I can accept. Wait, yes! At long last, the final battle. Ava Unit 1 vs Ava 13. Father vs Son. God vs Mortal. Adult vs Child. It took us four movies to get here, and we finally get the epic battle we deserve. Oh boy, this is so exciting. The suspense is killing me. SHIT! So where do we start? Well, it looks like shit, and it looks like a video game from a phone app. Actually, that's not even fair. Video games look better than this. Pachinko machines look better than this scene. Even that ride from Universal looks better than this. So what went wrong? And it's not that surprising that people actually said that this is supposed to be bad on purpose. Which is all bullshit, since the entire move looked good anyway. Even later on in the fight, it looks pretty good. So why is that an argument? I don't know. Now some people think that it's bad because it's all CG, which I'm gonna disagree with that statement because I'm the type of guy who's not really against CG. To me, CG is a tool that could be done well or done poorly. And anime is no exception, though I would understand the criticism since CGI and anime don't have the best history. But there are times where CGI in anime looks really good. Even older anime had CGI at the time, even the end of Evangelion. It's just the fact that the technology has evolved so much that there's more you can do with CG. And there's a lot more people that are more experienced with the technology and had to do a lot of good stuff with it. And I think there's plenty of examples of CGI anime that looks pretty good. And the rebuilds are no exception. Though I wouldn't say it's all perfect because we get to see video game characters in the background. But when they use something like the Avas, or the Angels, or even something mechanical, it looks pretty solid. There's a good reason why plastic and metal work best with CG. Even in this movie, the CGI is pretty good by anime standards. So if it ain't the CG, what is it? It's the motion capture. <laughs> For some reason, they thought that the final battle would be good in motion capture. Never mind the fact that motion capture done poorly is quite noticeable. 
by doing it in anime, a median has fewer frames per second. Yeah, that sounds like a recipe for disaster. But the big question is, why? Why did Otto make something like this? Well, I got a theory. It's not like what you think. It's trying to be tokusatsu. Oh. Now, I might be a nerd for this shit, but once you look at the entire fight scene, there are some obvious hints everywhere. The building's not being destroyed properly, like they're made out of cardboard. The obvious painted background. Even the way they move looks like guys in suits. And it could be the reason why motion capture was used at all. Because what they're trying to do is imitating guys in suits. And it makes sense since Ano is an otaku for toku. But even so, there are other series that do the idea a lot better than this. And they didn't even use motion capture. Not to say that motion capture can't be done well, especially in anime. And the idea of what they're trying to do isn't bad, but it's very clear that it's not meshing together well. They want to get peanut butter and chocolate, but it turned out to be oil and water. And it's probably more likely a last minute addition. Looking at some interviews, I noticed one that was actually kind of interesting. Now, if you look at the timeline, it says August 22nd, 2020, a couple of months after the original release date. Now, here's some footage for Shin Ultraman, and we see their footage says August 8, 2020. And comparing the two, it looks like they're in the same studio. And once we remember what Otto said, yeah, it's starting to make a lot of sense. And for those of you who say otherwise, it probably wasn't going to be there at all due to COVID. I mean, the entire thing was all just big, fat luck. Now, despite the motion capture being awful, I think this was the best fight scene in the entire movie. It's really because of stuff like this. Honestly, it's really fun seeing them fight each other in God knows what, in any background they want. And I'll give the film credit, it's something I did not expect it, and if you're like me, you might appreciate the fact that they showed something unexpected and also new and unique. Sure, it might be shit, and it's really silly, and different doesn't equal good, but it's still something to appreciate and give credit towards. Thank you. Well, I made it out of boo-boo here. I will admit this part was way too vague and I wasn't clear enough what I was trying to say. What I was trying to say is that I enjoyed the scene because it was batshit insane. Not just because it's different. Being different is one thing, going all out is another. I really did love they went all out in the ending, especially during the final battle. Going all insane and psychedelic. Especially with the concept we're dealing with. Like we're basically dealing with the human mind and imagination. Like if it was just them fighting each other in a giant city, it would have been kind of boring. Especially with the concept in mind. But here, because they went all out, it actually made it seem much more enjoyable to me. And actually became one of the best scenes in the movie. And it is something that I actually do appreciate. But admittedly it did make a lot of people confused. Especially this guy. Which again, no, I'm not trying to force people to enjoy things that I like. What I was trying to say is that if you were like me with the same opinions, you might like this scene. You can hate this scene all you want, I really don't care. It's all subjective anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But in the end, it does feel really vague, which I do apologize for. But hopefully this does clear things up. Anyhow, Shinji and Gendo continue to fight, but it turns out because they're identical counterparts, they pretty much have the same moves, and the battle doesn't really go anywhere. So in the desert move, Shinji decides to do the one thing he's always afraid to do. Talking. Back in the Wunder, we see Masao and the gang trying to help Shinji. The problem is the ship's on reserve power, and it turns out that Gendo's using both the spears up so no one could stop him. So what is the plan then? So wait, the plan is to make the ship into a material, just like the Black Moon, so you can make it into a new spear. What? At first, I thought the ship was made by the same material like the Black Moon, but nope, apparently I was wrong on that front. So the question is, how is that able to work? Like, is it because the Wunder is the body of Adam or something? How did you get the energy to make it? Wizard. Anyhow, we see Gendo and Shinji talking some more until we finally figure out Gendo's big secret. Evangelion. 
So Gendo's plan is to merge reality and fiction together so his dream can come true. Well, it can't be that bad, right? <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. <laughs> and yes, just like you, I was confused as well. But as a fellow armchair critic, my job is to at least try to understand what's going on. So I went on an epic journey across many lands to discover what it all meant. Across scorching deserts, freezing tundras, deep oceans, even the dangers of the wild. The journey was perilous, but after climbing through the highest point on Earth, I finally understand what it all means. It's a fourth wall break. That's it. That's why you see him fighting a Togusatsu set. That's why we also see film props everywhere. That's why Black Glove is referred to as Ava Imaginary. That's why Ray's head is hyper-realistic despite having anime here. And that's why the fourth wall literally breaks three times in a row. But there's much more to it than that. Remember when Gendo said he's merging reality and fiction together? What is the fiction part to Gendo? Well, you see, what Gendo is referring to about his world is the fictional world. And the world of the gods is our world. When Gendo is referring to God, he's referring to the writer himself, Anno, and the rest of the gods they're referring to were all the people in the film's production and to all the audiences that watch the film itself. So when Gendo refers to gods, he literally means you and me. And his plan is to literally kill God, rewrite the entire script so his dream could come true. It's basically an intergalactic invasion into this space through people. I, I'm telling you, it's what all the ancients said, it's what they warned of, it's what we're dealing with. They're demons. Well, at least what I think. For all we know, it could have been anything. But really, it's just a big fourth wall break. Commercial. Then hurry up before it's too late. Now in all fairness, breaking the fourth wall isn't necessarily a bad idea. And there's plenty of examples that do the idea well. What about that one? Yeah, that one doesn't come off. I tried. And the content isn't that new for even Galleon, because it happened in the original ending of the show, and even end of Ava to some extent. Unfortunately, it's not true for this. Now it's not just the fact that it's ugly. It's more the fact that it's just bright as hell. Fire! And it's because of the background. Because it's all yellow, which is a bright color, it's literally hard to watch. Which in contrast compared to the scene later, we see the same head, and yet it looks pretty good because it's in the red dark void. It actually blends really well. Maybe this scene could have worked better if they were all red, maybe a little darker hue. It could actually work. However, and I hate to be the one that says this, but this felt borderline experimental. <laughs> Now there are some people to say that this is all intentional, and to be frank, it's a fair point. If the goal is supposed to be weird and uncanny, just like EOE, then this would be plausible. But there's a difference between that and track records. If On had a consistent track record that was at least decent, especially when it comes to endings, then this would be acceptable. Unfortunately, once you look at his own work, it's not really that at all. You see, Otto's writing style is not really like a movie, but more like a manga artist. Meaning he goes to point A, to point B, to point C. And he doesn't really plan out an ending, or at least the details of that ending. And while there's nothing wrong with that style, it's still a double-edged sword, especially when it comes to making new ideas for that ending. And given the fact that Otto admits that he struggles to make new ideas... <laughs> 
And yes, while it is true there was much more factors on what happened to that ending, Anno's weaknesses are still clear. So even if it was true, this is more likely Anno making shit up as he goes along. As for the fourth wall break itself, it isn't that bad, but really it's just on the level of Metal Gear. Sure, it's weird and strange, and it is interesting, but overall it doesn't really add much to the story. Don't worry, it's a game. It's a game just like usual. You'll ruin your eyes playing so close to the TV. What are you talking about? Now despite the high levels of El Barry on the ship, Fiyutsuki pretty much is done with this shit and gives more of those other Avas. Mmm, so good and tasty? Not before I'm revealing her real name. So yeah, it's just uh, Mary plus Judas. And Fiyutsuki pretty much gives up. So after all of that, we see Willy preparing the spear for Shinji, but it requires their own ship to make the spear. So everyone pretty much abandons the ship. Dave, the emergency <laughs> destruct system is now at However, someone needs to stay behind the ship, and Masato, being the captain she is, has to do so. Oh, that's nice. Wait, there were children on the ship? Oh yeah, that's why. So after they escape in the escape pods, Masato becomes a badass one last time. So finally, we see Shinji decide to stop running away and confront his father. We then discover that Gendo still has an AT field despite throwing his humanity away. And thus they finally get to talk. And then we learn a little bit more about Gendo's past. Sure, we know a little bit about it in NGE. But here we go a little bit deeper. We learn that Shinji and Gendo are basically the same person. Since they have the same problems of communication and also have a connections with people. In fact, we learn that Shinji's Walkman actually belonged to Gendo. And all they really wanted to do was really just be alone. However, once they had connections with other people, they slowly changed to be more open. However, once they lost the ones they loved, they both went into a pit of despair. And ironically, were afraid of being alone. And while Shinji confronts his own weaknesses of being alone and losing others, Gendo did not, and only paid the price for it. So despite their differences, in the end of the day, they're both the two sides of the same coin. Like father, like son. But then Masato comes and stops even imaginary. So yeah, that's it. Masato pretty much rams into the head and makes a new spear. Not only the way to make the damn thing makes no sense, but to make it worse, it's a deus ex machina. The day is literally saved by pure contrivance. But despite all that, it isn't all happy, because Masato does sacrifice her own life, not just for Shinji, but for her own son. And it's a based way to end her story. Sure, it was an awful start, but in the end of the day, I think it was all worth it. But, the music should be different. What? Like, why is he even playing Joy to the World anyway? Actually, would it make more sense if Joy to the World was played at this moment? Since it's about the birth of baby Jesus, Christ itself, since it's especially about a new beginning anyway, why not use that song for that scene? Hell, you could still use the song What If for Masato's sacrifice. <laughs> 
like what she is doing for Shinji and her own son? Also, I'm not a weapons expert, but even I know that spear looks so impractical. It looks like more for shell than function. Sure, the spear does at least transform to something more useful, but this spear looks a bit much. Furthermore, why doesn't the head just crush the ship with its hands? Like, I get it, it's supposed to be a manifestation, it's not its true form. But why only use your hands just for blocking? You can still have the ship pierce through the eyeball regardless, so what's the point? I mean, I play through Star Fox, and let me tell you, that's not how it works. <laughs> Anyhow, Masato hits the eyeball and sacrifices her own life. <laughs> Thus, Shinji gets a spear and Gendo's plans are ruined. I do like the fact that Gendo has the balls to admit that he lost. They could have made him fight Shinji irrationally, especially when they literally lost everything, but it didn't go that route. Thank you. Gendo then says to Shinji that he's grown up by accepting what other people think and also accepting their deaths. You learn from Genda why he left Shinji. The reason why he did it was that it was for the best, not just for him, but for his own son. However, he realizes that was a mistake and decides to apologize to his own son for what he's done. So after that, he sees Yui, takes the Walkman, and goes inside the void. Forever. I gotta get out of here! So after all of that, Karu takes over instrumentality. So if that's true, does that mean everything outside is now paused, or is everything still going? I don't know. Karu then tells Shinji what he wishes for. But all Shinji wants is to help Asuka and the others. And here's where it gets even more confusing. Asuka. Yep, that's right, Asuka's a clone the entire time. Apparently the only one since the rest were all failures. Which is why we see another version of Asuka, because that's the original donor of the clones. And apparently the reason why she gave her own name was because she wanted to be a unique person instead of a copy. <laughs> Which, I totally thought of Asuka being a clone here, since she is essentially a different character anyway, and it's in a different continuity. And I guess it explains why she's able to pile on Ava without having a mother. Which also explains Rei's ability to pile on Ava without having a parent herself, especially in this continuity. So it does kind of fit. But here's my contention. If Asuka was a clone the entire time, then how come she doesn't get the same treatment as Rei? <laughs> oh, I thought you'd die and turn the tank if you don't get the same treatment. Like, that's what happened to Q. So why is Asuka immune to that? Like, is it because she's a good clone? Is that it? Like, either way, it's not explained. So what's the point of it? Why do I even bother? But then Ken Ken comes along and says that you're amazing just the way you are. <laughs> so after that, we see Asuka in the end of Evangelion ending. Apparently Shinji cured her from the curse of Ava, which means she's now an adult now, which is why her suit's broken, and now she's no longer an Among us! Shinji said she liked her too. <laughs> After that Shinji just boots her out of the anti-universe. So now it's Karu's turn. Apparently it was true that Karu and Shinji did met a couple of times before. 
and the reason for that was the Book of Life. What's the Book of Life? Who knows? The film surely doesn't. Now despite me saying this, the film doesn't really tell you that the time loop theory is canon. And once you think about it, it doesn't really make any sense. Like, if this is Karu from the original show, then why did he just bring Mark VI with him? The movie implies that he goes back to the moon with Mark VI with him. So, by that logic, wouldn't he just have Mark VI in the original series anyway? And even if he ignored that, it doesn't make any sense by that logic either. Because in the original show, Karu had a different origin. So even if they are the same character, the origins are still completely different anyway. I don't get it. Now, I am willing to accept the fact that this is the original Karu from the original show. However, it's most likely that they're talking about the multiverse rather than the Earth going through a time loop. Given the fact that the anti-universe is a thing, which also counts the world of gods, and in Shin Ultraman, it also referenced the multiverse as well. Now, given the fact that both films are being worked on at the same time, it's entirely possible that Otto had the idea of the multiverse in his brain, though I don't think you really understand how the multiverse works. Back to the plot, apparently Karu was lonely like Shinji, and he thought all the stuff he did was to make him happy. But it turned out to be a big misunderstanding, and Karu apologized for it. And it really wasn't about Shinji's happiness, it was all about Karu's happiness. And you don't have to take my word for it, that's Kaji's job. Now I know what you're thinking. Okay, so I'm confused. So why is Karu in Gendo's suit and why is Kaji there at all? What the fuck is happening? Well, I got good news. Apparently Otto does have an explanation on what went down. Supposedly after what happened in 2.0, both Gendo Fuyutsuki got ousted from NERV, and Kaji and Karu took their place as commanders. However, at some point, both Gendo and Fuyutsuki somehow got back control, and Gendo uses Sele, and another battle occurs, I guess. At some point, the third impact does happen, and Kaji's the one that sacrifices his own life for Risato and company. Thus, Willy is born, Gendo's back in control, and Freepono officially begins. Okay. And while it is nice that we finally get an explanation after all these years, the issue still lies that it's not in the movie itself. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that all extended material is bad. In fact, there are plenty of other franchises that I love that are guilty of this even Gelly included. But there's a big difference between something that's an enhancement and a requirement. For me, extended material should be used to enhance the experience and still be able to stand on its own, not a piece of DLC that acquires instructions to understand it. Let's see, Pirate Samurai have plus two constitution, minus three charisma, divide my number of geese. Do we have a protractor? I'm out of here. Still though, we are gonna get that DLC soon in a bonus feature in the Blu-ray, which I'll give Otto credit. At least he is trying to give a better explanation on what went down. But for me, I'd rather have it within the story and also enhance the experience of that story rather than it be just a simple add-on. If you're watching this, you probably know that they already have a prequel already. There is another prequel manga, which also has voiceover, but there really is not much to talk about this one. It's just set before 3.0. It does expand Asuka's character a little bit, but nothing much there. All that being said, it does address things more. Like how did the third impact started, how did the ale barrier spread, and how did people actually survive it? It was honestly not a bad short, but it was also kind of disappointing because there wasn't a lot of detail. And by the end of it, I was like, that's it? And what's even more surprising was that the focus was actually on Midoriya out of all people. Which is fine, it does expand her character a bit more, but I kind of wish they did more of it. I wish he had more backstory about this world we're in. Because that's actually one of the few things I actually did like about the rebuilds. Like the new setting they're in right now, and how do the characters deal with this scenario. But despite that, we don't get enough answers. And don't get me wrong, we do get some answers, but I wish there was more to it. And it's overall a bit disappointing. Except for one thing. 
Yeah, apparently Midori's hair ain't dyed after all. It's actually permanently turned pink by even Galleon blood. I'm sorry, what now? And besides, the entire relationship they're trying to portray with Karu and Kaji is all bullshit. That is one big pile of shit. Despite trying to tug at our heartstrings, we never really get to see that relationship at all. Sure, in retrospect, it makes some scenes in 3 out make more sense. But on the other hand, there really is no purpose to it. It's all just worthless. Anybody have any sunscreen? So anyway, Kaji suggests to Karu that they're gonna water Waterman's together forever, I guess? I don't know, the film doesn't go into too much detail anyway. They're just watering watermelons for all eternity, and that's pretty much it for him. So now it's Ray's turn. Becoming the meme that everyone loves. And I guess carrying a fake baby? Like, why does it have nails on its head? Rei says to Shinji that she's fine here, but Shinji suggests to Rei that the village that the other one live is a good place to stay and call home. Oh, that's why she has the baby. Duh. Shinji says to Rei that he's gonna erase all the Avas so everyone can live normal, happy lives. So, you're not gonna rewind time or revert the world, but you're gonna rewrite the world without Evans. I'm confused right now, G. You do understand that it's still a major change, no matter what you say about it, right? Like, isn't rewinding and reverting essentially the same thing as rewriting? Shinji has a good point though. Since the Aves cause more damage than good in this continuity, I think he's right. We should get rid of all of them. Especially when they have literally no purpose anymore, since all the angels are essentially gone. Like, it's like getting rid of mosquitoes. They cause more suffering than what they're really worth. So, get rid of them. Ugh, really? I never thought they would say something that's so cringe in my life. And here it is. And what makes it even more cringe is they actually show the title of the original series. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! Now despite all that, I'll give the film credit. It didn't felt forced when they did all the memberberry stuff. Okay, not all the time, but at least it felt like it was part of the story. Especially when it comes to the anti-universe, since the entire thing is a big illusion anyway. Then it's also a peek into the Evangelion multiverse in general. Like the scene with the projector. Oh, that's that good shit! Anyway, Shinji says to Rei, Well, that's good. I hope you- Oh, you lying son of a bitch. You didn't tell Ray you're gonna sacrifice yourself? I understand there are white lies, but man, what a dick move, Shinji. Regardless though, I do like the fact that Shinji's willing to sacrifice his own life, not just for the Earth, but for everyone that lives on it. Truly a selfless act. Your emergency brake is on! Don't tell me how to drive, jackass! But then his mom comes in and pretty much cucks him. So Excuse me, what the fuck? What do you mean by that? Do you mean like the beginning of the rebuilds in general, or do you mean in the end of 2.0? Because the latter makes the most sense, since we already saw it, so why did you not mention that? And guess who else is back? It's Gendo! He's gonna sacrifice his own life too with Yui. I guess he didn't die in the void after all. No, he didn't. お前が選ばなかったエイティフィールドの存在しない。全てが等しく単一な人類の心の世界。他人との差異がなく、貧富も差別も争いも虐待も苦痛も悲しみもない。浄化された魂だけの世界。
そしてユイと私が再び会える This is really embarrassing You know, I love it when movies tell you what's happening, only being contradicted at the same time. That makes a lot of sense. Now, in spite of that, I do think it was a wise decision to have Geno sacrifice his own life with Yui for not just her son, but to save the world. Some people have a problem with this due to his actions within the film itself. And while I do understand that side of the argument, I have to disagree with it. For me, redemption arcs are much more complicated, and I think we can all agree that it varies from person to person. Some people think there's a line that cannot be drawn, while others think it's limitless. Now, this might be a difference of philosophy again, but I think that any character can technically be redeemed by any action, but the redemption has to be worth it and it has to be well executed. For example, Darth Vader did a lot of horrific things, even if you ignored the prequels. A young Jedi named Darth Vader who was a pupil of mine until he turned to evil, helped the Empire hunt down and destroy the Jedi Knights. Now the Jedi are all but extinct. Like he still committed a genocide, and he's pretty much a space Nazi. However, once he realizes his son's in danger and realizes what he's become, he sacrificed his own life not just for his son, but saving the entire galaxy from the Emperor. Sure, if he was theoretically alive, he probably would be in space jail. However, his actions still result of saving the entire galaxy. His redemption was still worth it for what he did. That was pretty wizard, wasn't it, son? What? I'm bringing it back! Not to say that death's always the answer. Sometimes a character can sacrifice their own life, but the redemption can still count if they do come back alive, especially if they really meant it. Hell, some characters don't even have to die and still be redeemed. It depends if they're really serious about their redemption. But there is a good reason why death equals redemption is a common trope. Not to say that redemption arcs are always flawless, Steven Universe's redemption arc is probably the most infamous example. But the reason why the redemption doesn't work isn't the fact they got redeemed at all. It's the fact that redemption wasn't really worth it, and they weren't really serious about it at all. Plus, they got away with it for what they did. The reason why Dark Vader's redemption worked was that his redemption felt genuine. And the same thing goes with Gendo. Yeah, he destroyed the planet and pretty much killed everybody and every living thing, but he made up for it by not only fixing the planet, but also reviving every single a living thing that also includes the human species. He was willing to sacrifice his own life with Yui, not just for the Earth, but to their own son. So what he did was worth it. Sure, in fairness, it was the easy way out for Geno's redemption. But I'll say this, at least they didn't screw this one up. Thank you! So after all of that, we see Unit 1 and 13 sacrifice themselves. Hooray! All the Avas are basically destroyed. Hooray! Humans and animals are basically back to normal. Hooray! And balance is restored. And everyone's okay. Well, I think. Actually, come to think of it, we don't really know if they're really alright. Sure, the movie implies they're alright, but we never see that physically. I want to know if Baby Sanabe lives. And while we're at the end, I should mention the fact they're playing the song, Voyager, from Bye Bye Jupiter. Which, from my understanding, is considered one of the worst movies of all time. Yeah, they're all big shots, like members of Congress, journalists, Environmentalists, watch out! Roger, arrival B deck. Happy finish! We then see Shinji sitting at the beach, and the whole thing breaks down into storyboards, like in the original show. Why is this happening story-wise? I don't know. We then see Mari make it back too, and everything goes back to normal, and says goodbye to Unit 8 plus 9 plus 10. Fuck it! It's Ava 50! So after all that, we... What an adventure. An Evangelion. Adventure. What?! So, Shinji's an adult now, I guess? And I guess the other characters are okay too? And Mari's there as well. 
sometimes foreshadowing of <laughs> Which is kind of weird since she's actually with Shinji as a baby. Man, I never knew Shinji was into MILFs. Actually, thinking about it, it doesn't make any sense either. Like, if Shinji becomes a normal adult in this world, wouldn't Mara just be an old lady by that logic? It's either that, or really she's just a clone of the original Mara. Given the fact she's able to ride an Ava without a parent, and the fact that we don't know how they regress their age. But despite all that, we really don't know about Mari's origin anyway. Sure, there's some hint to give us some clue. Really, the answer is... maybe? Actually, now that I think about it, the entire thing felt rushed anyway. And all the characters didn't have a proper conclusion. Asuka's felt rushed, Karu's felt rushed, even Rei's felt rushed. It's basically Shiji saying that she's gonna live in the village, I guess? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. And I'm not saying they're all duds. Masato's was good, Gando's was good. Hell, Rei Q's ending was pretty good. Even Shinji's conclusion was pretty solid overall. But I think the problem is, is that there's just too many characters. And we don't get to focus on all of them. Not saying that it's bad to have a large cast, neither that it's bad to have it in a movie format. But if I had a more connection with Q than the real Rei, there's a problem. But really the entire thing doesn't really matter, because the whole relationship SUCKS! Now, this isn't about a relationship that I did not want it. I'm totally fine with Shinji going out with someone else other than Asuka or Karu. However, there is no chemistry between Shinji and Mari. At least with him and Asuka, there was some chemistry. Sure, it wasn't the healthiest, but there was at least something. In the end of Evangelion, they discovered that they had the same problems and they both understand each other. Sure, they probably won't be in love again and just be friends more likely, but like the planet itself, it's a first sign of them recovering from their problems. But here, there's nothing anything significant about Mari's and Shinji Shinji's relationship. They mentioned the whole hand thing for each other, but other than that, there's nothing really much to talk about. I don't even think they talked that much at all. Now you might be thinking, Hold on, why didn't you talk about the meta-narrative about Anno's life? Every YouTuber says it, so it must be true. Well, I'll tell you why. Because it really isn't. SHUT, Shut UP! Just like Jesus, they hated him because he told the truth. Now, this might be a personal thing, but despite what people say, the movie doesn't really feel like a meta-narrative at all. If anything, I kind of felt the opposite when I watched it. And I'm not saying you can't have that interpretation, but I just don't get why people think that way. Even some of the arguments- DON'T ADD UP! Some people think that him breaking the fourth wall in general is one such example, which I don't even agree with, because there are times when other media has break the fourth wall before, but it doesn't require me to understand the author's life. That's retarded. Others think that the village was probably more likely a reference for him being Studio Ghibli at the time. <laughs> Which I guess is true, but even then, where is that reference to him making Shin Godzilla with Shinji Aguchi? Which Otto admits that it was one of the more important things in his life. You would think that Otto would put something like that in the movie. But it ain't. But even then, Shinji's a character that runs away from his problems. Even if you don't know who Otto is, you probably understand that Shinji's a character that runs away all the time. But the most famous example is that Otto based Mari on his wife. And there's this aspect of like this character that they introduced that has really no purpose, who seems to be a stand-in for uh, the creator Anno's wife. He was pretty much already tired of the story he was telling, tired of Ava, he's got a new wife, one who's sweet and who writes funny comics about him, and wait, she kind of looks like Mari. Oh, I love my wife! I love my wife! Ah! You look up footage of mangaka Miyoko Anno, who Hideki Anno married in 2002, you can see that she also likes wearing glasses of the same style. Coincidence? I think not. I mean, especially in now the current context of Anno's wife and Mari, it all makes total sense, but... It does. I think he had the burden of Evangelion on him for so long, and yeah, his wife kind of just came in like, hey, I'm gonna take that away from you. You know, and he's denied that this this character, Mari, is supposed to be analogous to his wife whatsoever. He's, like, come out saying that, swinging a couple times. Oh, of course. Uh, I don't believe yeah. him. The only way you can view this as acceptable is if you yet again rely on outside knowledge to understand that Anna wants to brag about his wife. And the only reason, the only reason Mari is the final girl is because it's different. Oh, wow! No shit! And then recently I just realized what she is. I'm like, oh, Mari is literally 
the yellow lightsaber at the end of The Rise of Skywalker. Like, that is 100% what she is. Like, the reason why Rey turns on a yellow lightsaber at the end of that movie, and the reason why Mari shows up at the end of this movie, is the exact same reason. It's because it's different. That doesn't make any sense. Now, this rumor probably started with Toshio Okada, stated that Mari's based on Otto's wife. で、教えてくれるのがね、もうちっちゃい女の子で、なんですけど、これがもうどう見てもあんの模様この化身なんですよ。What? つけていて現実世界に帰ってきて、それがマリが外してポケットにいるっていうシーンがあるんですけども、なんでそんなことするのかって、いやそれはもう犬だからです。犬だから中堅ワンコだから首がついてるんですけどもですね。Now Otto did indeed comment on it in a Q&A session. He also stated that characters like Mari and Asuka really came from Suramaki than Otto himself. He also did a comment on his wife's manga, saying that she's a strong woman, but very sensitive and fragile, and hides it all with all the toughness in her heart, which sounds more like Asuka than Mari. Now let's be real, it's totally fair to not believe Otto's response here, if he was the only one that says this. And all due respect for Okada, he was indeed right about Otto's style of writing, and his struggles making a new idea. The problem is that for one, Otto is not the only one that says this, and the other one was not a baseless statement. That was actually Okada talking to Otto and Yamaka themselves. Also to point out, the people that disagree with Okada are people that work with Kara anyway. Sure, there is room for possible bias, but on the other hand, these were people that were closely involved during filming, and a lot of them have a bunch of insight on what happened during the production. Okada, on the other hand, hasn't been near the production at all. In addition to that, apparently Okada hasn't met Otto for a quarter of a century, and hasn't even met Miyoko at all. And above all else, even Miyoko Otto herself disagrees with that statement. So, who do you rather believe? People that were in the production itself, and were close to Otto? Or a guy who's making shit up and basically just match passing. Now, this has technically happened before with Karu. Now, allegedly, Karu was supposedly based on Koniku Kohara, which was a friend of Ano in real life who is known to direct a chunk of the Sailor Moon anime, but more famously was the director of Revolutionary Girl Utada. Now despite the claims, he denies that they were based on him, and he says that his dialogue is more based on Otto than himself. So why did I mention this? Well I think the problem lies is that people are just basing Otto's life on just Shinji, when in reality they're not much at all. Yeah, sure there's some elements that are similar, but in truth they're not the same person at all. Now I'm not saying that there is no element of Otto in Evangelion, there clearly is that element there, and I personally believe if it weren't for Otto, Evangelion wouldn't have been the same show. But I think what's really going on is that Otto's not put himself in not just Shinji, but to all the characters. Well, yeah, but, but, okay, not all of them. But it is true that Otto put some of his traits in within the characters themselves like Asuka, Misato, Ritsuko, and even Gendo. And again, I understand it's a different interpretation, but for me, I think it's fair to say that Otto put himself into all the characters, not just one. Now let's be real here. I think it's entirely possible that Otto got this idea, at least subconsciously, meaning that he probably had this idea in the back of his mind and probably didn't realize it until it was brought up to him. What I disagree with Okada and other people who think the same way that it was the first idea and the only reason why it exists. A more likely explanation was that Mari was probably the only option they had left. You can't have Asuka because they both literally said they're moving on from each other, so it wouldn't make much sense anyway. You can't have Rei because technically speaking, she's Shinji's sister, and that's incest. And incest means no wincest. You can't have Karu because he's basically dead, or alive with Rei as friends. No! Now let's think about this. Let's say Mar was a place of some other rando girl. Other than that, the end is just the same. Now think about it, what was Mari's purpose in the plot?
Well, nothing. She attributes nothing in the plot itself. Sure, there's some minor moments, but that's pretty much it. So here's my theory. My theory is, is that they chose Mari because she was the only option left on the table, but also make her look like she had a purpose in the story, when in reality she never did. In other words, you guys have been duped. We've been speckled or That's not even a word and I agree with you. Again, this is speculation on my part, and you can disagree with me all you want, which is fine by me. But the reason why I disagree with this theory isn't because of Anno, it was because the arguments were convincing and the evidence was the most plausible. Okada's arguments, on the other hand, were not. I think at the end of the day, we should look at these things at least more critically, or at least have a nuanced approach. Now, I think this rumor was probably started by ignorance than malicious intent, and there are people who do reject the theory. Well, that's good. And in fairness to Okada, he seems like a pretty nice guy, and there's some things I actually do agree with him on. But, I think he's just very, very wrong. And I think he probably thought that was the case when Mari and Miyoko looked exactly the same. Was that the reason why? <laughs> you know, I've been thinking about it for a bit, and I think they're just stuck in the anti-universe. Given the fact the whole thing ends in a weird note, and we never get to see them truly leave the anti-universe. Yeah, it's probably more likely that they're just stuck there. Forever. Oh, fuck! Which is probably the reason why we see the other characters on the other side of the station. Which that represents the real world, while this one represents the anti-world. But really the ending's trying to be both a conclusive ending, but also be an ending that has an interpretation. And it's clearly not working. <laughs> and to clarify, I'm not saying that it can't work. There are plenty of things that do this idea well. Like, geez, I don't know, the end of Evangelion? While the ending of that was precise enough as it is... But at the end, it leaves you on a bittersweet note. And the emotions are so thick that it can go either way. And because of that, they let the ending open for your own conclusion. And it's all just perfect. And it's not just that too, Shin Godzilla is also a good example of an ending that's compelling, yet up to interpretation. Even Shin Ultraman did that right. I gotta take you back to the land of Lyle. Nah man, I wanna be with and study the humans a little more, I feel really familiar to them. So can I stay a bit longer? Okay, I will separate your body with the guy now. Welcome back. But with Fry's ending, it's not only very messy, but it also feels very rushed. And I think it's because it's an overall happy ending. Take that! Make a happy ending! Thank you, everyone! Thank you, Elmar! Boom! Which, I don't think it was a bad choice at all. In fact, I actually expected a happy ending, especially since the last one ended in a more negative note. Though I would consider that bittersweet, I wouldn't mind a happy ending for this story. And just for variety's sake but it was very obvious that they were more focused on making a happy ending than a well-executed ending. For example, the moral of the story. Now, at first glance, it's like this. Hey, are you feeling depressed? Feeling that life is all hopeless and there's nothing left to live for? Well, worry not. There's a guy that has the power to change your life for the better and all your problems will be solved just like that. Hey, Darman fam. That's not a good message. That's a horrible message. Though I don't think that's what they meant. I have a feeling what they were trying to say was this. If you're feeling depressed and life is all hopeless, it's okay to have other people help you around with your struggles and learn from those people and their experiences. And if something bad happens, instead of going back to a pit of despair, you should use that knowledge to not only improve yourself, but to help other people's problems and to make the world a better place. Which is probably more likely given the fact that Anno says this. It's okay, it's okay. And while it's a good message and all, the enemy God is giving us the wrong impression, and it's probably because it was written the very last minute. So after that, Mari takes the choker off of Shinji's neck. They both leave the station and head towards that karaoke bar that got shut down up here. And the movie finally ends along with the rest of the rebuild. Lord, I'm confused. Is this a happy ending or a sad ending? 
It's an ending, that's enough. So yeah, you probably understand why I have mixed feelings on this movie. On one hand, the movie is a vast improvement from Free Puddle, and the first half was overall pretty solid. But despite the mass improvement, the entire movie felt like it was going downhill anyway, at least in a filmmaking perspective. But why did it turn out this way? Well, it's probably because of Otto himself. Some people think that Otto's pride got the better of him, and that's why the movie suffered. There's a lesson to be learned about pride here. It's all about pride. But I think it's the opposite. I think Otto had no pride while working on this movie. And you can clearly see it in the documentary itself. He's not satisfied with what he's gotten, constantly trying to improve the shot even though it doesn't really need it, even rewriting the script from 20 to 40 times. <laughs> Now, this is probably over-exaggeration, but once you look at all the other stuff, but also him stating and trying to do all this stuff to improve his own work, yeah, it's very clear that Otto has a case of perfectionism, which isn't a bad thing. I think it's good that Otto is at least self-aware about his own work, but I think the problem is that he did too much of it, and too much of anything is not good for you. And I think it's the main reason why a lot of people got frustrated. And the other issue was that there was a lack of communication. <laughs> I have no idea. Anno has the impressive skills of not speaking right and also not explaining things well, which is probably because he has some form of autism, which kind of makes sense given the way he behaves. And people who are autistic are more likely to experience depression than other people. Sound familiar? Not to say that he is, and it's speculation on my part, but it's still something to keep in mind. But I think the biggest issue was the lack of time. When I saw this part of the documentary, I knew we were in big trouble. And given the fact he struggles to make new ideas, yeah, that explains a lot. But in the end of the day, was it really all about money? Well, yes. But is it all just about pride and money? And was he never a good director in the first place? No. I think it's the opposite. If anything, I think Otto has improved and degraded, and he even admits his own faults as well. The reason why stuff like Neon Genesis Evangelion, or the Anti Evangelion, or Shin Godzilla, or even Shin Ultraman worked was because his strengths were with him rather than against him. And it's not to say he didn't have that advantage while working on the rebuilds, he clearly did. But he was not always perfect. His weaknesses were right there at the very beginning. And I'm not saying he was always a bad director either. Anno has made good things before that people actually liked. The problem with the rebuilds is that his weaknesses were much more obvious to look at. Similar to George Lucas in the prequels, the prequels didn't suffer because he was always a bad director. The prequels suffered because his weaknesses were much more bigger than his strengths. And I think the same thing applies to Anno and the rebuilds. After all, they're very similar people once you think about it, which isn't a bad thing at all. But despite his shortcomings, I think Anno has technically improved as a filmmaker since the 90s. And looking at the documentary, it does look like he's trying his best. Sure, he was struggling, but at least he was trying. <laughs> I truly do think that Anno did care what he was making, and I think he wanted to make the best movie he could, not just for himself, but to all the fans who waited all this time. And I do believe he wanted to spread his awareness about depression, and also improve the anime industry. That being said, I still think this is the second best rebuild movie, and 1.0 is still the best. Now, hear me out. While it is true that it is a remastered version of the original show, it is at least a good remaster. In fact, I think there's some scenes that are better than the original show. 2.0 does not have that luxury, because despite what they said about changing it, the results still turn out to be the same, and it's just a bad clone of the original show. 
And yes, 3.0 is still the worst. But despite all that, 1.0 and 2.0 are technically my least favorite, while 3.0 and Thrice are actually my favorite because at least they tried something different with those. Sure, it wasn't all great, but despite that, I remember those movies more than the other two because at least they were trying something new. And it's something I do at least appreciate. Sure, it wasn't all great, but hey, at least it was different. Now, some people think that this is going to be the very last thing we'll see of Evangelion. Like, this was, this was what I think is the perfect way to end the Evangelion franchise. Now, the reason it's bittersweet for one, for one goofy reason, is that there's probably a lot of people who are waiting for this ending, and they didn't get to see it because they probably died. And judging the fact it's a giant cash cow, I do not think that's going to be the case. Especially if they're planning to make it like the Gundam franchise. Which I wouldn't mind to see a G Evangelion. Or a Turn A Evangelion. Or even something like Beast Wars. That would be fucking awesome. I like the idea of Animal Ava hybrids. I like to see that idea come through. So the biggest concern I have is how they're going to handle this franchise in the future. Having a new setting and characters is good and all, but is it going to be as successful as NGE, EOE, and even the rebuilds? While Gundam was successful in its own right, despite all that, a lot of the shows that Gundam has produced were not as successful, and they're really just banking off the Universal Century. And despite the mass amounts of money, other than model kits, Gundam really isn't that successful. <laughs> And I have a fear that even Galen might have the same fate. But then again, if franchises like Final Fantasy or Xenogears can still be successful despite having a different continuity, then I'm pretty sure even Galen might be in the right hands. As long as you have the right people working on it, and it's overall well executed, then things might turn out okay then. As for Ano, I'm kind of interested in his Shin Kamarider movie. Oh no! But the question is, will he come back to Evangelion? Well, if I'm being honest, do you really think he really wants to come back here again? Given the fact he got depressed twice in a row, and only being happy making the stuff from his childhood, do you really honestly think Anno wants to work on this shit again? And besides, given the fact that Anno is willing to let other people work on Evangelion just like Gundam, he doesn't have to worry about it because the other guys can do the work for him. Plus, he can focus on other projects. It's a win-win. Regardless though, Otto did say that he might return back to the franchise one day, and if he ever does, I'll be there to watch it. And who knows, maybe even Gal might be an even bigger franchise around the world by then. And once that happens, we can finally make Otto's dream a reality by stopping depression and saving the world. <laughs> Finally, it's all over. Now I can finally get started to my next review. Whatever the hell that is.